I extend a very hearty welcome to all of you. Uh, we are here to uh, uh, pay tribute to Dr. Malcolm Asisaya. Uh, as we all know, uh, he was a great development uh, economist by training, but he wore, wore many hats. His greatest commitment to eradicate poverty and illiteracy and to foster growth in a modern economy he was an institution builder and the Madras Institute of Development Study in Chennai was closest to his heart. He continued his support to teaching and research even after his death in 1994, willing all his finances to the setting of a trust, the Malcolm and Elizabeth Adsesaya Trust was born in 1999. Dr. Adsesaya Engagement with India International Center dates back to 1960s when he played a major role in getting UNESCO affiliation to the center. He became a member of the center of its Council for Cultural Studies and was later elected life trustee. IIC became his hub when he was in Delhi. In 1980s, he was convener of economic affairs group that was entrusted with the task of reviewing the functioning of center from its inception. Dr. Al Sesaya initiated the mid-year review of Indian economy at India Enterprise Center in 1975-76, which even today is one of the definitive surveys of India's growth projection. It examines the course of macroeconomic trends for the first half of the year and provides an assessment of the prospects of the economy for the full year. Since 2001, the Trust has supported this annual seminar at the Centre, the proceedings of which are later published as a book. For the past eight years, this event has been hosted by the Centre in collaboration with NCAER, and the book is also published jointly. Each year, an eminent invited speaker evaluates the outlook of the discussed year. It is our privilege to welcome Professor Sudipto Mandle, and the entire panel and look forward to the deliberations. As we all know, our, we are, our country is facing economic slowdown and it has created you know, uh, multiple problems uh, you know, in the country, particularly the infrastructure sector has been very badly hit. Job crisis has never been more serious than what is today. So I'm sure that today, uh, Professor uh, Mondle is going to present completely a realistic picture to us and he would also perhaps indicate as to what is the way forward to take our economy out of this morass. So with these few words, I once again extend hearty welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, Shri Ken Srivastava, Director of IIC. Uh, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here again uh, um, on this November morning. I wish the AQI was a little better, but uh, here we are uh, with another media review of the Indian economy. When IIC approached us uh, several years back, uh, we readily accepted the mantle of continuing the tradition that uh, Malcolm Edisatia so eminently uh, launched in 1976. Um, NCR uh, regularly monitors the Indian economy. Uh, we do quarterly forecasts. We do uh, surveys of business expectations. So this is very much part and parcel of what uh, the National Council of Applied Economic Research does. Uh, and it actually helps us uh, both put the analysis, the forecasts together, but also gives us an opportunity to vet them with a very distinguished audience that comes to the India International Center, consisting both of its own members, but of course invited guests as well. Um, we are particularly privileged this year in two ways. Uh, Professor Shudipto Mandal joined NCR as a distinguished scholar some months back and has thrown himself into our macro and forecasting work. And so we are very pleased to have him with us. Shudipto is an old friend, one of India's 
best macroeconomists, and certainly um, his joining our team has greatly expanded the work we are doing. I also want to recognize Rudrani Bhattacharya, who is also uh, a macroeconomist, and this is the kind of collaboration that think tanks like ours should be doing. Uh, Rudrani is at NIPFP, and we are very pleased that we are doing this together with NIPFP. Uh, we also will have uh, Pranab Sen, uh, former chief statistician of India, uh, and somebody who uh, watches over uh, the Indian economy very closely, and he'll be with us when we do the panel discussion in the afternoon. Um, Mr. Shivasa has already laid out the challenge in front of us and the challenge in front of the country. Um, we seem to be in a perfect storm situation where consumer demand, investment demand, foreign demand all seem to have been impacted. And uh, I think we need to find a way out of this uh, situation. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, there are members here who write frequently about this, who actually sit on decision-making committees of the RBI and others. So uh, this is going to be, I hope, a very rich discussion. Uh, as Mr. Shivasta said, we do produce a book out of this, uh, and we hope that that will also add to uh, the kind of solutions that we are looking for. This uh, media review is very timely because uh, the Ministry of Finance is busily preparing the budget uh, and it, some of this feeds into the uh, budget discussions. The Ministry of Finance invites several of us to uh, come to a, a discussion uh, prior to the budget and many of the things that are discussed here are ported to that discussion by, by me and by others who are present here. So we hope to have a very good discussion. Uh, we will try to stick to the time um, so that uh, we can finish also on time. Uh, we will first have uh, the NCAR team led by Shudipto and Dr. Bonali Pandari, who has been the mainstay of this work for several years now, uh, give us a view along with Rudrani Bhattacharya of the economy. And then after tea, we will go to the panel discussion. We have four eminent speakers who will be introduced uh, at the panel itself. And then there'll be an open session where we can all field our questions to the panelists uh, and our own views about what needs to be done uh, to uh, shift to a different trajectory uh, in these very difficult times. So with that, let me stop and turn over to uh, Professor Shudipto Mandal uh, to start the uh, presentation of NCR's findings on the economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. Let me join uh, Ms. Srivastava and you in welcome every, everybody in welcoming everybody this morning to our presentation of the media review. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, this is now a long established tradition in paying homage to uh, Dr. Malcolm Adishishai, who had started this many years ago. And for the last uh, eight years or so, NCR has been partnering IIC. So we are continuing an old tradition. But I do want to mention uh, uh, at least one of a few small changes. And that is the new partnership we have with uh, NIPFP, which uh, Dr. Shekhar Shah just mentioned. When I came on board at NCR uh, a few months ago, I suggested to him and to Dr. Atin Roy, the director of my former uh, institute, NIPFP, that given the fact that we are all resource constrained, why don't we join forces and combine the macroeconomic teams of the uh, NCR and the NIPFP? And both of them very enthusiastically responded to this. We now have uh, a joint team working on, on the macro side from the two institutes. Uh, there are two parts to this work. One is uh, policy simulation uh, modeling, which uh, looks at the impact of uh, changes in policies or other shocks to the system. And that's not what we are discussing today. But the other part is a forecasting exercise based on a model which we have jointly uh, developed. And uh, Professor Rudrani Bhattacharya is here, as uh, Shekhar mentioned. <coughs> to to make that present. So we will start a presentation with uh, Rudrani uh, walking you very briefly through the model, hopefully without getting too technical, 
and then Bornali is going to walk us through the trends in the real economy as well as on the trade sector and then I'll come back briefly towards the end with a few remarks on what's happening on the policy front. So with your permission, if I can request Rudrani now. Before you start, Rudrani, may I just recognize another person of uh, uh, a great importance to us, at least at NCER, and somebody who has a direct connection to Malcolm Adisatia. Uh, I want to recognize uh, uh, our good friend Shashank Bhide. Uh, Dr. Shashank Bhide was until recently the director of MIDS, uh, but before that, of course, was uh, research director at NCR. And after his retirement from MIDS, he has very kindly agreed to come back to NCR. And we are just very privileged to have him as well because he was, up until recently, the director of the Madras Institute of Development Studies. So, Shashank, thank you. Rudrani, please. So uh, here uh, I'm, hello, good morning. Uh, I'm Rudjani Bhattacharya from National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. And I'm going to uh, present a joint work by NIPFP and NCER. So we are basically uh, going to present the nowcast for uh, quarterly growth rate of uh, India for Q2 2019-20 and annual for, uh, and forecast for annual growth rate of India for 2019-20 financial year. So for nowcast, uh, basically the idea is that to predict the uh, GDP for a particular quarter, uh, GDP growth for a particular quarter from a large number of high frequency indicators. Uh, when, uh, um, and we can do that um, by uh, using those indicators, we can predict uh, the GDP number with uh, whenever the GDP numbers are not yet released. So CSO is coming with the quarter 2, 2019-20 uh, numbers in a few days. But we are using the high frequency indicators. We, are, we can predict the uh, growth for this quarter right now, which we say that it's a zero month ahead now cast. We can also do a one month ahead of release of GDP numbers or two month ahead of release of GDP numbers depending on uh, the release of information of the high frequency uh, information in that particular quarter. So uh, that's how the uh, idea is. So. Uh, we use uh, uh, for now costing uh, the uh, we use the a large array of in uh, monthly indicators um, those indicators include industrial variables these are iip uh, production of two wheelers production of commercial commercial vehicles service variables uh, include cargo handled at uh, major ports number of tourist arrivals number of mobile connections Monetary variables include food credit, non-food credit, aggregate deposits, uh, external variables, exports, non-oil imports, price, uh, CPI for industrial workers, and fiscal variables include uh, revenue receipts and non-net uh, tax uh, revenue. Uh, so we use a factor augmented time varying parameter regression model. Um, basically, the idea is that uh, we estimate factors from all these um, large number of indicators to so basically doing that by doing that we process information from this large number of indicators and reduce the dimension of variables in but in a uh, small number of factors and then we regress uh, regress the quarterly GDP growth, quarterly year-on-year -year GDP growth on those factors where the coefficient of regression coefficients are varied over time. So those are not constant. We varying the, we varied them over time. By doing that, we we are able to capture the rapid changes in the. Uh, Indian economy and that's suitable for emerging economies which are subject to quite random shocks and structural changes. So that's uh, how the model is. Uh, and um, finally, um, how do we obtain the Naukas? So we have, um, we have 
estimated the model till the um, quarter 1 2019-20 using the data till that now use the from the monthly indicators we have the growth rate uh, we have the information available till q2 2019-20 so using the uh, parameters estimated till Q1 1920 and the growth rates um, from monthly indicators that we have from Q2 2019 20, we now cast for GDP growth of Q2 2019 20. That's the, that's the idea of getting the now cast for this quarter. So that's what we uh, get. And this is how our model uh, performs and what the focus, uh, what the now cost we get. So we find that we, uh, um, all the turning points, uh, so the black line is the actual GDP uh, quarterly year on year uh, growth uh, um, series. And uh, uh, green line is the um, predicted, is the uh, model uh, generated. In a series. So we see that our uh, model is able to capture the turning points in the quarterly year on year growth rate of Indian GDP almost quite accurately and um, like it uh, could um, get the, uh, the dips in 2008 uh, um, global financial crisis drought of 2009 then in recent years, the 2016-17, that uh, the de effect of demonetization in 2017 Q1, uh, the demonetization happened in 2016 Q4, uh, but the effect is visible in 2017 Q1. That uh, that trough is being picked up by our model uh, itself. So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so uh, then f uh, our now cost for Q2 2019 uh, uh, 20 uh, is 4.9, and that's our point forecast with uh, one uh, with 68 percent probability it can go to either five or four. So there is a 68 percent probability, this is the point forecast, there is a 68 percent probability that it will go to 5 or 4. Okay. This so is for quarter, is it? This is for uh, Q quarterly year-on-year -year growth. Q2. Q2. You'll see the actual 15 days from now. Right, yeah, that's the one. That's right. That's yeah. uh, next, we do uh, 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 forecast of annual GDP growth um, that we do using uh, annual indicators because uh, this is a forecast uh, and since we do not have any um, <laughs> indicators for annual uh, GDP to predict which are available ahead of GDP release. So we uh, now in our model we um, regress the GDP growth on the uh, La, uh, factors of the previous periods, not that same period. That's how the model is uh, changed. Uh, so here, sorry. That's how the model is changed. So it's the it's regressed on the previous periods, and these are the annual indicators that uh, we choose. So stock of food grains, uh, development expenditure of the total development expenditure of cent center and state as a percentage of GDP, non-development expenditure of center and state as a percentage of GDP, real non-food credit, real effective exchange rate, real interest rate, real money, uh, foreign exchange reserves in real terms, fiscal deficit at percentage of GDP at market prices, growth of gross capital formation and ratio of export to import. So using these indicators, when we uh, focused using this same, this is also a time varying, uh, time varying coefficient model, dynamic model, when we uh, estimate it. So this is the model, this is the annual GDP growth model. Black line is the uh, actual uh, GDP growth and green line is the predicted one. And we get 
that for the financial 2019-20, our GDP will be growing at 4.9%. Um, uh, with again, there is a 68% probability that it will go 5.9 uh, uh, or 3.9. Within that range. Within that range. Is it a window, window of your time varying coefficient? It's not a window, so it's a. It's um, not a rolling coefficient. Some sort no, it's not rolling. It's state space model. Okay. So it's estimated by Kalman Field. So thank you. So this what it is. Thank you. Um, good morning and turn on the microphone. Yeah. Good morning, and um, so uh, we'll try to explain where um, why these why these numbers make sense to us, uh, depending on what we've seen in the last quarter or quarter two. Um, what we see is the first uh, is that the GDP growth uh, has annually uh, has between 15, 16 to 18, 19, we know it has gradually declined. Um, the, uh, the one important message that I want to, uh, that I want to emphasize is that even though that shows 7.2 to 6.8 between 17, 18 and 18, 19, it hides aggregate uh, quarterly variations. And when you look at the quarter right here, it has been a steady fall downwards from 7, 8 to 1% 1, 1 in quarter 4 to 5% in 1920 quarter 1. Um, so uh, the, the similar story, we see that in GVA growth also, gross value added, it's a mirror story that it has fallen and it kind of fits in with, um, in quarter two, the now cast is suggesting that it's going to be 4.9% subject to a confidence interval, of course. Um, when we look at sectors, individual sectors, we look at agriculture, industry services, the first sector is agriculture growth. Uh, agriculture growth GVA has pretty much coll uh, collapsed in 18, 19 quarter, the last three quarters of quarter three, quarter four, and quarter one. It did show some marginal recovery here, but it's it's been in a different base. And this actually shows up in the aggregate variation two, annual variation two, where we've seen a steady fall in agricultural GDP uh, in the annual numbers. When we look at uh, the southwest monsoon, um, here, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you two things here. The first thing is the sp that at the end of the southwest monsoon, we had, um, um, we had a normal monsoon. And, but uh, but uh, there's always a but. The but is that uh, there were spatial and temporal variations. So the first thing is, if you look at these numbers, the lime green colors, it's showing you the rainfall that what was in June, the variation from the long period average uh, of last 10 years. And the blue numbers are showing you what was at the end of the rainfall, June to September. What we find is that across regions, uh, the variation was, uh, it was quite in deficit at the, at the end of June. But when we at the end of the season, uh, we find that all all India was slightly above, uh, it was 10 percent uh, greater than the long period average. Uh, but in the east, there was a minor deficit. North almost made it, and uh, the west there was an excess rainfall. So at the end, there are there have been spatial and temporal variations, but this. Even this picture does not end the story because we know that post monsoon also there has been rainfall which have affected crops and crops quality. So, uh, based on um, area weighted rainfall, um, we estimate uh, NCR has an independent model of estimating the Kharif output, and what that suggests um, based on these econometric estimates that uh, the f uh, that we are going to have um, higher output uh, than last year. Of course, the first advance estimates of Ministry of, Adva uh, Ministry of Agriculture, first advance estimates suggest much lower output, but uh, these uh, estimates are subject to some uh, downward adjustments because of the post-monsoon rainfall. But uh, the based on the area weighted rainfall, we suggest that there's going to be higher output than last year. So the agriculture is, uh, the me message is that uh, uh, agriculture, there is going to be some buoyancy in agriculture, how much is a story, but uh, how much is subject 
to uh, final estimates, but uh, there is some buoyancy in the agriculture sector in terms of curry production. And the Rabi outlook is going to is also looks uh, optimistic uh, for one reason that there the water storage is uh, from the from the dams. We know uh, know that our water storage is uh, optimum capacity, and the because of the rains, there's a groundwater is also um, uh, moist. So both suggest that Rabi outlook uh, is going to be optimum. When we go go to agri industry, and that's where the store that's the key story message here. Uh, that the uh, industry growth, if you look at the, just the annual averages, it would suggest that between 17, 18, and 18, 19, industrial growth went up. But that's not the real story. The real story lies here, between 18, 19, quarter one to 19, 20, quarter one, uh, pretty much. Our estimates show that industrial growth has collapsed. It is steady, continuous fall downwards. It is a steady uh, slipping down. And um, when we look at the more um, current indicators from quarter two, the story is even turns worse because this is your IIP general, which shows negative output for quarter two and negative growth for quarter two, and so does IIP manufacturing, which is 77% of the weight. So the industrial growth story is. Um, pretty is quite gloomy when we look at services with this services pattern is slightly more mixed uh, at least from these variations if you look at the quarterly and annual variations though in 1920 quarter one even eight, even this actually a short decline between um, two quarters but when we look at the more um, um, recent indicators from quarter two again the Everybody, sh ev all these indicators are showing a very sharp decline uh, post uh, uh, in the last few quarters. The important thing is, um, this is something that, as a, as an observer, we are always looking out for. Is this, uh, sustain? There's a sustained decline in cargo traffic across tra transport modes. So here, both railways has declined, the uh, and ports have declined. The black and the red lines are ports and railways and this one the red line is the air cargo traffic which again shows a decline the, so across air transfer uh, air railways and uh, ports we see a decline in cargo traffic which actually suggests that economic activity is at a lower levels when we look at this so this was the real side when we look at the demand side as dr shah already mentioned we find that real private consumption expenditure has fallen. Uh, again, here the story is the, uh, the annual average, annual numbers hide the quarterly fall um, uh, from 9.8% to 3.1%. Um, and so C has fallen, investment has fallen. We can see investment completely uh, significantly falling down from 11.7% to 3.6% in quarter four, and then quarter one, there's some marginal recovery. Again, here, the if you just look at the annual numbers, this hides the significant variations in the quarter. I do want to add here is that cap, if you look at capital goods uh, in this index of industrial production, that has been in, uh, shown negative growth for nine months. The pictures are not here, but it's in the report that, uh, and even consumer, uh, Durable goods have been in negative, has shown negative growth since June 2019. And uh, I think the most worrying part that we have is the consumer non durable goods, which has shown negative growth in September 2019. So that would suggest that people are even cutting down on essential goods. Um, and then uh, along with that, even government demand expenditure has fallen. And here we find this there's significant compression of government expenditure. Even quarter one, it showed only 8.8% growth. So on the demand side, we have fallen. And when we look at the external side, external demand, exports and imports, what we find here is that, again, exports uh, have also steadily fallen. Export, this is exports of goods and services in rupee terms. It has fallen from the high of 26.1% to the 1.9% in quarter two and uh, imports have actually declined. Since we do import a lot of capital goods, um, uh, uh, I think it's a signal for a large, uh, it's not a signal on consumption, it's a signal on production activity within the economy. 
So both on the supply side and demand side, we have, prob uh, we have had challenges. And ultimately, when we look at the business sentiments, uh, business sentiments have fallen by 15.3% between last quarter and this quarter, first and second. They have only deepened. Uh, when we look at other uh, indicators of business sentiments, but the Nikkei Purchasers Managers Index for Manufacturing and Services, here again we find that it, uh, PMI manufacturing actually fell in October and uh, PMI services has been below 50 for two consecutive months of September and October. With fall in, um, uh, with generally fall in uh, output activities and demand, um, here we find slightly, uh, here we find the end of inflation. What is inflation telling us? And here the interesting story is that um, is more in, this is emerging. While inflation was moderating in the first part of the year or it remained below the RBI inflation target, we find that in September, uh, in, there has been slight uh, increase in inflation in the retail inflation CPI uh, headline inflation, whereas WPI has declined. So there is some divergence taking place between WPI and CPI, the red and the black line. You can see this um, completely going in different directions. The last point that I was, was sort of want to emphasize is this core CPI. The core CPI inflation, which is the um, non-food and sorry, the non-food and the non-fuel uh, inflation energy, is actually going down. So, which suggests and which actually shows up in the numbers that it's we know fuel and light inflation has been quite moderate. So, CPI inflation, headline inflation, is essentially being driven by food inflation, and that sort of is what uh, the some of the story that has happened in last year. And pass on the baton to Dr. Mandrit now. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Bernali. So we saw there a uh, rather uh, grim picture of what's going on in the real economy, and it's very widespread. Uh, it's not just limited to manufacturing. I mean, it's fairly widespread for the economy. Some relief this year from uh, agriculture. And what is really worrying, as she mentioned, is that you know the dip in inflation, which is something normally you welcome, but when you see that it is all being, you know, the increase is being driven by food prices, in fact, you split it. Uh, there's not enough time, so she didn't go into it, but you split it between rural and urban. It's really being driven by urban food prices, especially fruits and vegetables, whereas not in the rural sector at all, it's going down. Other prices are rising in rural areas. So that, again, is a pointer to the considerable distress that we have, especially in the uh, rural sector. But moving on now to look at what's happening on the uh, uh, policy front. Uh, the RBI actually has been very active, and in particular the uh, Monetary Policy uh, Committee, of which we have a distinguished representative here, uh, Professor Chetan Ghate, in steadily bringing down the uh, policy rate, what, what we call the repo rate, from about 6.5% uh, to 5.15% uh, uh, now. The idea being that if you bring down the policy rate, this will gradually bring down the interest rates, uh, commercial interest rates in the market, and that that will help drive credit and therefore revive uh, economic growth. I mean, that's the theory. What you find actually has been happening What? The top one, red one. Mm -hmm. red one. Yeah, what you actually find has been happening is that this is going down, this is the policy rate, but the uh, weighted average uh, lending rate of banks taken as a whole, you find that it's, act it's really and, uh, you know, not uh, going down. And in fact, this is all about the lending rate on fresh loans. I'm not talking about the average lending rate for the stock of loans, but that, of course, can move and up, up and down depending on what's been paid back, what has been written off, and so on. And also, if you look at the term deposit rates of uh, uh, banks, this is uh, also not really going down. So there has been some reflection of this decrease, uh, 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 the transmission, but very, very marginal. So in effect, the issue that is uh, arising out of this 
is can monetary policy at this juncture really do anything to try and revive uh, demand and revive growth and the answer seems to be that it is unlikely. Now, uh, why is that happening? Why is the transmission not happening? Uh, if you think about it, what do commercial banks do? They, they, they get money at a certain cost and then they lend it. Now, obviously, the rate at which they can lend, those average lending rates, are driven by uh, the cost that they have to bear, namely, let's say, the, the interest rate they pay on fixed deposits and so on. Uh, and that, in turn, is driven by what options uh, savers have compared to putting their money uh, in, in the banks. And that's what we are trying to capture here. Here, here you see that policy rate I talked about earlier, which has been steadily coming down. Uh, then you see the that green line there, that is the 91-day Treasury bill of the uh, government. That has also more or less, you know, caught up with the that that's reflecting the decline. Transmission is happening there. The blue line there is the benchmark uh, one-year government security, and there also it is happening. But when you look at the 10-year GSEC, that is the you know the uh, benchmark rate, and that has not really come down uh, very much. In fact, it is higher than the uh, uh, five-year uh, fixed deposit rate of, say, the State Bank of India. Now, in addition to that also, there's, of course, the small savings uh, schemes, the national small savings schemes and the interest rate there. That also has remained elevated. So when savers have these options, why would they put their money into fixed deposits in banks? So the banks cannot, therefore, reduce very easily the interest rates on their uh, fixed deposits and they can't do that, then they can't reduce the lending rate. Therefore, your transmission is, is not uh, happening. Uh, let me now move on to the uh, uh, credit story that is partly driven, of course, by interest rate, but by also other policies of the RBI and general conditions in the market. Here we are looking at non-food credit. Why non-food? Because food credit is largely banks giving money to the food corporation, uh, which is more an administrative uh, type of affair, depends on the procurement, and uh, that money is always available, depending on how much the uh, food corporation wants to borrow. So it's really the non-food credit which gives you an idea of what's going on in the rest of the economy, and you can see that that also has been steadily coming down from Q3 of 1819. Very sharp kind of uh, decline in uh, non-food credit, which of course is a reflection of the uh, decline in economic uh, activity. Now a question arises, is this going down because uh, people are not wanting to borrow money, they don't want to invest, or is it happening because the banks are not prepared to lend? Now, here is an interesting picture you see over there. This is a breakdown of the credit flow by different uh, categories of borrowers. And you see over here what's happening to the micro and small industries and the medium industries. The credit to them is actually going down. There has been a shrinkage in credit to the services sector as a whole. The industrial sector, it's been growth but very small. Uh, this is the allied, uh, agriculture allied is the food co food corporation, so that story is not particularly interesting. But this is the part where the crowding out is really happening. It's happening because today the public sector borrowing requirement, that is of the central government, state government, public enterprise, all taken together, is over 9% of GDP. When the entire financial savings of the uh, household sector is about 7%. So, the government is not only dipping into the entire financial savings of the household sector, but also that of the uh, corporate sector. And you're seeing here the kind of crowding out that is going on. Uh, so that was the monetary side story. Now let's look at what's happening on the uh, uh, fiscal side. Here is tax revenue. Uh, this is what happened last year compared to the year before the growth rate in tax revenue, it was 8.5%. If you compare what happened to actual tax revenue as against the budget for last year, it actually fell short of the budget target by 8.5%. 
Now, given that background and the fact what is happening now, our uh, uh, tax revenues are growing at one and a half percent. This is half year over half year. So it's a good indicator rate at which the annual uh, tax is likely to rise. We are only growing at one and a half percent. What's the target? 18.3 percent. You can see here the completely unrealistic projections in the budget. And already a couple of days ago, the Central uh, Board of Directors did say that they are going to fall short by about uh, one and a half million uh, rupees on their uh, tax uh, uh, revenues. Now, where is this shortfall happening? The large shortfall actually is happening in indirect taxes, which accounts for about 41 percent of total revenue, not just tax, but total revenue. And you can see the shortfall. The target here for this year is 17.5 percent. What are we doing? We are actually falling short of last year by 2.1 percent. Now, all of this is getting reflected, therefore, in the total revenue, but partly buoyed by what's happening on the non-tax revenue side, and especially dividends and profits which the central government is uh, getting out of uh, financial and non-financial uh, public sector enterprises, especially the large take on the dividends from the Reserve Bank of India, which has grown at a phenomenally high rate following the uh, Jalan Committee recommendations. And because of that, non-tax revenue has grown by over 90 percent, and it's partly moderating the shortfall on the tax revenue side. But this only accounts for about 11 percent of uh, total revenue. So the net story is that our net revenue receipts are growing at 11 percent compared to a budget target of 19 percent. So a huge compression, uh, a huge shortfall in, in uh, uh, government uh, revenues. <coughs> Now, that is, of course, getting reflected on the expenditure side. Uh, and here you see uh, what is happening. This is the uh, central government's total expenditure. Uh, it, was, uh, it grew at 8.5 percent. Uh, this is, uh, that is what actually happened in 1718 over the previous year. This is what happened last year compared to the previous year. So it's growing at around 8, 9, 8 percent or so. If you look at this year, expenditure is a little better, it's growing at 14 percent compared to what happened in the corresponding period last year. However, the target again is completely unrealistic to grow by 20 percent. This is nowhere near what has been achieved in the last two or three years. So again, there's likely to be a huge compression in government expenditure this year on top of the compression that happened uh, last year. This is the same picture being shown in, in terms of revenue expenditure, which is the bulk of government expenditure. But let's keep to this side of the story. So our take is that to some extent the decline in growth, apart from very bad conditions globally, inter internally, etc., is actually policy driven. It was the huge expenditure compression last year, which partly accounts for the dip in growth. And we are getting another compression on top of that this year, and this is likely to uh, uh, reduce uh, our uh, growth even further. Uh, now, of course, you could have allowed this expenditure not to get compressed because of revenue shortfall by allowing the deficit to increase. But these are, are our targets. This is what was the actual deficit. This is the uh, provisional, I mean, sorry, this is uh, 17, 18 actual last year against a budget target of 3.3 percent. We contained it at 3.4 percent. Why? Because the expenditure was compressed. You didn't want to pass it on as an enlarged uh, uh, deficit. And this year, the budget estimate is 3.3 percent. Our expectation is that it might slip a little bit, but not too much because of the fact that already the public sector borrowing requirement is too high and it is keeping up yield rates and so on in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, financial uh, sector. So probably, again, we are going to see a large compression. In fact, that's already happening. As I showed you, this year also we have seen so far a substantial contraction in, in, uh, in government, both revenue as well, uh, contraction growth of revenue as well as expenditure. And we think that that's going to continue and adversely affect growth. However, I do want to end on a somewhat positive note, and this goes back to the forecast that Rudrani uh, no, now cast and forecast, that we're probably bottoming out because we have seen this huge dip in growth uh, uh, 
from uh, the year before to last year and if you look at the quarterly growth rates that we showed you. But 4.9% is what we are expecting as a now cost for the second quarter. And we are also saying that the growth uh, for the year as a whole is likely to be 4.9%. So that what that suggests to you is that probably we are now at the bottom. It's been a huge steep decline, but hopefully won't get worse than that. So let me end there. Thank you. Uh, with my co-chair's permission, um, what I would suggest, given that we are keeping very much to our time, that we use the remaining 28 minutes or so for a Q&A already on what has been presented. Um, the focus, of course, has been very short term. There are longer term and medium term issues as well, including our trade relationships with Asia, with the West, uh, a number of other issues uh, on climate, uh, the environment, uh, water scarcity. There are a number of these larger issues, jobs, of course, and our demography. So uh, what I would suggest is if people can keep their questions short so that we can get as many as uh, we possibly can and then we'll request the team to respond. So if you have long comments, leave them for the nice long tea break that we have. Uh, but if you can please identify yourself. Uh, this is being live streamed. I should have said that in the very beginning. So the entire world has access to this. So you may wish to note that and remember that when you speak. Um, and for that reason, uh, this is not to, of course, censor you in any way, please feel free to say what you want. IIC has always stood for pleurisy uh, and for open debate and discussion and NCR as well. So with that, let me thank the team. I think this is a wonderful uh, explanation of and, and, and what's very nice is that they make it accessible to all of us who are not uh, technically oriented. Uh, I should note that uh, our forecasts are on the optimistic side. Abhik Barua is here from HDFC, and so he knows what all the market economists are saying. And I have decidedly seen numbers like 4.2% uh, for the quarter. <laughs> so uh, you, will, you will have a chance to come back on that. So <laughs> let's hold your fire for the moment. Um, uh, but there will be, I'm sure, a lot of uh, uh, discussion in the next few days. I should also mention another thing that hasn't been mentioned here, which is the NCER index of business uh, confidence that we also do, uh, and that also is a barometer of how the 500 firms that we survey uh, feel about uh, both the current situation and the immediate future, and of course they see it from their own firm's point of view. But this is something we've been doing for a large number of years, and it's usually a good barometer of what is coming or a good predictor of how in the corporate sector or firms in particular feel uh, about the economy. With that, perhaps you could open it up, uh, if you can just uh, raise your hand so that I can see or Mr. Shivastav can see, then we can uh, go around and have a few questions. Uh, again, may I please request everybody keep it short uh, and keep it to a question. So please, sir. There's a microphone right in front. of business we've improved so much internationally where is that translating into is, is there a lag where we will then start doing better or is it something that is uh, uh, not affecting investment because of some other reason what is the problem Thank you. that's a nice short and very sharp question please sir uh, the gentleman here you can use the microphone right in front of you as well General conditions that are declined globally, therefore, you know, the production and quality and growth has gone down. But you hinted that the government was also not making the right moves. Would you like to point out one or two of these moves that they could have done and prevented this decline? Excellent question. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Alamdar Abbas, and first of all, I, I am giving heartiest congratulation to India International Center along with National National Council of Applied Research to organize such a significant and remarkable function here. I I hope it would 
develop a new tendency of uh, india would show a new path of global peace to make india most powerful nation of the world i am writing a book also yeah, india could we come to the question 2014 and now i may ask a question uh, i think uh, uh, con control inflation and reduce revenue deficit increase domestic product and check at moderate uh, our fiscal policy and monet monet monetary policy for to make india most powerful nation of the world thank you dr uh, professor panda yeah i am manoj panda from institute of economic growth in the last two three quarters every time we are hearing that we have bottomed out and every time we expect a better growth but actually it is turning out to be the worse so what are the factors this time that the team is more optimistic that it will be better in the coming quarters looks like we have some interference from somewhere i hope <laughs> yeah, we are being live streamed so it's probably the uh, the web web team that is doing this uh shudip do you want to take these and then uh, i'll come to you and i'll come to the others who have raised their hands shudip just glow oh it's on now good uh on the ease of uh, doing business why it's not showing up and so on uh i think uh, the panelists particularly uh, mr binak uh, chatterjee who's here will be able to give a better response to that since he has his uh, feet in the market and so i'm going to leave that for him to answer on the uh, uh, question of uh, what we think uh, that's a very good question thank you about what we think the government is not doing right i'm not going to get into other areas of policy which have to do with structural reform and so on because this is a very short term media review but to stick to the macro questions i think uh, uh, the uh, monetary policy side the central bank uh, uh, quite apart from all the huge problems of you know non performing loans and so on which is a different issue it's trying to deal with that it's taking time but that apart on the actual interest rate policy as i said earlier i think uh, the npc has done what it needed to do it might i don't know uh, they might still continue with the interest rate but that's a bit like pushing on a loose string because that's not getting transmitted to lower interest rates in in the market the problem really is on the fiscal side and an inadequate reg recognition of the problem you know as you know the main interventions that happened reducing the uh, corporate rate put, putting some money for you know recapitalizing the banks etc now those are all uh, if you will uh, attempts to revive the economy from the supply side and where the problem really is on the demand side and to get money into the hands of consumers especially poor consumers with a high propensity to consume so that quickly the income multiplier gets generated now that recognition has not been there adequately uh, an analysis of what really is the problem there has been responses have been more piecemeal do this do that i think largely in response to uh, lobbying groups who have more visibility and voice than others so that really is my answer on that uh, on the question of why we think we have bottomed out uh, we may not have bottomed out i was only pointing to a possible silver lining at least that's what the model is telling us it's a model that has performed very well in the past so we have some confidence in it but as you know very well models are models and forecasts are forecasts with you know uh, error margins as uh, both my uh, uh, partners did emphasize we'll know in two weeks it's very critical what we see in the quarterly figures that will come out in two weeks from now whether we are actually bottom bottoming out or not but since we have been painting a very gloomy picture i just thought almost a throw away comment i'll draw some attention <laughs> to the fact that we may be bottoming out and uh, i recognize that our forecast has turned out to be a little uh, 
less pessimistic than that by Nomura and others which are saying that we are going to end up the year with 4.2 percent. Thank you, Shudeep. The, the lady here, and can we get her a microphone? I think there are, maybe we need a few more uh, handheld microphones. Can we, can we arrange them? Uh, I'll come to you, sir. Yeah, uh, my name is Anu Chandu, and uh, thank you for all the figures you presented, even well, though they were all very dismal. So my question is that, you've actually partially answered my question, why? Why are they so dismal and where is the hope of the change? So that also he says we bottomed out. So can you just reflect the other speakers on why, the reasons, why they are so dismal? We'll come to that. Uh, the gentleman there, uh, first the gentleman, I, I saw him. I'll recognize you then. Thank you, sir. Uh, Eka Jain, I am from the urban sector. Uh, uh, very good study, very comprehensive. My question is that are we looking at some non-conventional innovative uh, sources of, uh, uh, of financing? For example, uh, we have been focusing too much on agriculture and industries manufacturing, uh, but many countries have gone with higher education, maybe entertainment and proper, uh, property rights, etc. These kind of things. Are we looking at this as to be in to invigorate our economy? Thank you. Uh, please. That's just marketing. Well, in its own way, it is an annual brainstorming session under the ages of NCA, ER, IAC, and all that. One first question is that during the last six, seven years, the SME and MSME sector is plummeting as compared to the large industries. Though it is the largest provider of employment, about 11.3 crore, 29% of GDP, and exports around about 45. So, what is being done for the SME and MSME sector? Number one. Number two, the same thing is. Into GDP from 8.1% to 8.5%, it has come down to below 5%. Well, I have one figure with me that between 2014 and 2019, the average GDP of a five year block was 7.3%. This is the first time that in the post independent India, such an average was attained in a five year block between 2014 and 2019, 7.3%. And now it can be anything below 5%, 4.1%, 4.2%. So what is being done so that you know these indicators are buffed and bolstered you know, in the years to come? Thank you. Um, any further questions? If not, uh, we still have 10, 15 yes. minutes. So, <coughs> yeah, please. I'm Lakshmi Jal is from PTI. I, have, I need one clarification. This forecast is for the Q2 of calendar year and uh, forecast for the full fiscal or the calendar? So the Q2 is the fiscal year. Yeah. So it's the forecast. So why, why not for the Q2 is for the fiscal, right? Right. So that the quarter that ends in September. And the data will come out shortly. So that's the now cast. The fo annual forecast is for the full fiscal year. Right, so there, that's that's a technical question that I can even answer. Um, anybody else here who? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to. Uh, yes, please, behind. Yes, Sarang Shidori, University of Texas. Big question on uh, trade compositions. Uh, we have three sunrise globalized sectors in India for the most part: the autos, pharma's, and IT. IT, yes. So, wondering if there is you see any green shoots of the emergence of any new sectors or subsectors that are. Uh, that we are seeing an uptick on exports on that we can hope for as, as a new tigers in the future at some point? That's a very important question, hopefully heralding uh, change. Could I throw in a question about um, the recent uh, uh, events in Bangkok where we, uh, for the moment at least, have declined to join RCEP? Uh, and that, in a sense, has really led to quite an outpouring of both support and opposition and lamenting 
the fact that uh, Indian industry has lost a chance to pull itself up by its bootstraps and actually begin to compete more effectively against the rest of the world and particularly Asia uh, where market growth is likely to be the highest. So that seems to have also added to the pallor and the gloom uh, at least in some minds and be useful to think about that in terms of the investment confidence that Indian industry has in itself. The CII president has written a very uh, very forceful uh, um, uh, op-ed the other day uh, suggesting very strongly that we should be competing against the rest of the world and not protecting ourselves. Uh, so that's also something that's in the background of these uh, very short-term issues that we are contending with, but we must not lose sight of the medium and the longer-term issues as well. So uh, any further questions? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to give uh, Mr. Shvastha, please. So, I got a very simple question to ask. Uh, you mentioned that despite the repo rate going down, uh, it is not making any impact on the lending and uh, deposit rates so far the banks are concerned. Since the deposit rates are continuing to be at the same level and therefore the lending rate has to be higher than that. Now, for a common investors, what are the safe avenues available for investment other than the banks? So, if the banks decide to uh, reduce the deposit states, the depositors have really no option. And I read the statement of uh, Reserve Bank Governor that here after Reserve Bank is going to ensure that whatever reduction is going to be done in repo rate actually gets reflected in the lending rates. So I would like to have your comments on this. Uh, I'll, I'll come back, but maybe Gordon Ali would like to take a couple of the questions asked and then I'll come back. So I'll answer three questions about the why. I think the, gra the what we showed here is essentially there's been, uh, I mean, the economy on the demand side is being driven by four factors. Uh, there's external demand, there is uh, private consumption demand, investment demand, and government expenditure. If you look at these four components, essentially what we're saying is private expenditure has collapsed. I mean, consumer durables go goods have been falling for nine months in a row. I mean, if that's not a signal of anything, I don't know what is. And the worst part is that now consumer durable, non-durable goods, which basically means food, clothing, shelter, is actually falling. So uh, as also sh showed negative growth rate in September, which was one of the things holding up. So private consumption expenditure is falling. Exports of goods and services have fallen to a paltry 1.9%. Uh, so that means there's no external demand. I mean, there are many reasons. I, I mean, don't take all the time. But for a variety of reasons, we have not been able to leverage our advantage, one of them being the mention of the RCEP point, uh, which has again been more expanded in, our, uh, in the report. The third thing is investment demand has fallen. Uh, business sentiments are falling. Investment demand has fallen both for supply and demand reasons, but mainly, mainly for demand reasons, uh, supply reasons of, uh, um, of the fact that uh, uh, for the NPA problems, banks are not willing to lend. So, uh, the, um, uh, and other reasons, where basically rates are not weak, transmission of rates. So, C, I, G, all have fallen. External demand is not there. Where is the demand? And the government is not in a position, as Dr. Bundle has pointed out, that it's not in a position to expand expenditure. So, where is the demand going to come from? Uh, of course, on the supply side, our agriculture is subject to vagaries of, of this thing. We thought we had a good monsoon, but post-monsoon there have been issues. So, um, so uh, the, the, the challenges is the challenges are various uh, um, uh, are various st structural reasons, small reasons. So these together ex explain why we see such a gloomy outlook. Um, about the MSME sector, the government has done. Um, has the mudra loan uh, which was supposed to enhance credit to the micro small and medium enterprises but when we look at the picture uh, here we see that uh, specifically the uh, credit to micro small and medium enterprises are not going up uh, there is a small uh, uh, addition that uh, even when the business sentiments we have it by firm size and when we see that even business sentiments by firm size seem to have fallen across firm sizes i think the only green shoot here that we can say is that we find that the micro firms that is firms with annual turnover less than one crore show some improvement in sentiments but given that they have seen very large fall in the last two quarters and sentiments just going above by a moderate amount doesn't really make up 
So MSMEs, uh, of course, again, there are reasons of demonetization, GST, which they have not, uh, have they been particularly uh, affected by the uh, by these two uh, uh, shocks to the economy, uh, especially the implementation of GST. Uh, so uh, it's a reform. So uh, this not being able to leverage this adds to the compounds the problems. Of course, when the rest of the world is in a shock, it is very hard to uh, match, um, you know, what we saw in between 2004, 5 and 11, 12. Um, we have to recognize we are part of the world and the global finance recession has added uncertainty beyond um, 11, 12. So we are in a period of uncertainty and within that we have had our own level of exogenous shocks to the system or policy shocks to the system, which compounds our problem. Um, and um, I think uh, th th those are a couple of questions to, uh, just thing. Just to add to Bornelli's points, yeah. just to add to Bornelli's points, the rural sector is also very much depressed. Uh, if you look at the real uh, wages, the growth in real wages, that is growing at a negative rate. So the effect of M um, the um, MG NREG that uh, increased the hike to the uh, uh, minimum wages because of which the wages everywhere in the uh, all over the India has increased in since 2008 that has been now uh, flattened out so and also what happened is that um, after demonetization, there's a lot of, uh, uh, in the urban areas and all, there are people who were working in the informal sector and all. And the demonetization hit it uh, very worse. And they left their work in the urban areas and went back to the rural areas and joined the workforce for the MGNREGA. So that actually reduced, the, they put a downward pressure on the rural wages. And now the rural wages are growing at a negative rate. Just I have checked the data and I have seen that they're screwing at it. So there's no um, demand for, for from the rural side, and uh, even the uh, food prices are also in the rural. Food prices are also declining, as Sir was saying. So that's a uh, big uh, reason for uh, you know the, the dismal picture for the ground. Uh, thanks, Rudrani. So I'll pick up. Uh, uh, three or four of the questions that were asked. First of all, let me address your uh, question uh, about uh, options for ordinary investors, uh, you know, people like us. Uh, <clears throat> apart from uh, bank deposits, you have these national small saving schemes in which you can uh, put money. And those, as I said, I mean, from an, from our, from an investor's point of view, that's a good thing, the rates are high, but it means that that's why the transmission isn't happening. There is also, by the way, a couple of other options uh, here. Now, there's an app that has been issued. I'm, I'm very non-savvy about this thing, but you actually, retail investors can uh, put money into long-dated uh, GSEX, which you normally, it's the banks who put money in the, uh, those things. Or also, of course, you can buy debt mutual funds. So there are these uh, few uh, options. Uh, I'll take the question on RCEP, which uh, Shekhar raised, uh, along with uh, new trade green shoots uh, that was mentioned. You know, I think you're referring to uh, Noshad Forbes. Uh, <coughs> uh, it was, if you will recall, completely different and at variance from the rest of the industry. At the time when we were, uh, you know, before walking away from RCEP and after walking away from RCEP, there was a complete drumbeat right across industry and it was also the farmers because they did not want to be exposed to external uh, competition and this was picked up by the political spectrum across the board. Uh, the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, uh, BJP's affiliate, the Congress party, the CPM, everybody was on the same page, walk away from RCEP. Uh, Noshad Forbes, being a very enlightened person, <laughs> uh, has taken a, 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 a different uh, tack on this. Uh, and this is not, of course, part of a midterm review, but my personal take is that and I've just written on this in uh, yesterday. It came out in in Mint uh, on this that at this juncture, probably we didn't have a choice because we had not been able to negotiate 
on a number of key points which are very critical uh, for India. Uh, there are a number of things there, particularly relating to uh, uh, you know information sharing and so on, which are actually weird in with some of our internal laws. The same happens with the investment provisions in that. Uh, quite apart from the fact that we were not able to get the, you know, initially India was trying to get a much smaller uh, spectrum on which uh, taxes, uh, tariffs had to be reduced, uh, I think something like 80% for ASEAN countries and only something like 42% for China, but we couldn't sustain that. So there was this worry that there was a huge drop in surge in imports and so on. However, that being said, I think there India has no option eventually since the multilateral system is breaking down to go through these, uh, these regional platforms and RCEP is a real mega platform and it's the only game in town as I've said because the other one TPP has gone and uh, so we have to be there but to get advantage of it we need to do things on our side. Our producers need to uh, also get their act together, raise productivity so that we are competitive. And there's no point saying we are not competitive, so we will not join this. You know, so but that's easier said than done. I have I won't go into that now. We don't have time, but I've discussed how the East Asian countries will do this, and that's uh, just uh, uh, 30 seconds, uh, Shekhar, because there was a question there uh, or here about other policy reforms, uh, education, etc. You know, those are all very important, but these take time to take effect. And certainly we should do those, but in order to buy the time for these things to take effect, you need to address these, uh, you know, short-term, medium-term things that we've been focusing on. Thank you. Shadipto, uh, we are about to uh, break for tea, but I uh, particularly want to ask Vinayak because I think the ease of doing business is an important question, and Vinayak is in the heart of the difficulty or ease of doing business given the role he plays in the infrastructure sector. So, Vinayak, about a minute or so from you. No, less than a minute. See, there are two different indicators. If you notice the World Economic Forum index of competitiveness, we have actually slipped a few points. And if you see the World Bank ease of doing business, we have, it seems to be easier. The only point I want to make is that from Indian industry, we have conveyed to the World Bank that we have some very serious issues on the modalities and methodologies they use to come up with their ease of doing business. And I'll just rest at that. So with that, uh, I should just add one more thing that precisely for the reasons that Vinayak mentioned, NCR itself has now been doing something called the uh, State Investment Potential Index that looks more at outcomes rather than the laws as they appear on the books. So as part of our index, which we do every year now, uh, we also have a firm survey. So there's a, there's a labor pillar, there's a land pillar, there's a political stability pillar, there's an economic policy, there's a state-based, and then there's a survey of firms. We're also working particularly in the land area, given how complex land acquisition, transfers, uh, rehabilitation, recompensation, etc. have become, we are also looking at a land records and services index precisely to get to the kind of granularity and on the ground conditions rather than what appears in the books. With that, let me thank uh, the NCR team, all of you for joining so actively. Let's break for tea. We'll be back at 11.15. It's a nice generous half an hour tea break. So please uh, talk to our colleagues and, and raise your questions. Uh, that we can then reflect in the panel discussion that uh, I'm so glad Pranab is here. Pranab Sen will moderate and we have four very forceful and, and thoughtful uh, speakers. So please come back at 11.15. Thank you very much.
हेलो चेक
Uh, can I request everybody to settle down, please? Where's Abhi? Hmm? Abhi? Abhi must be coming. Ah, there he is. Okay, uh, we are into the second half of uh, our uh, media review. Uh, I'm Thank you, everybody, for coming back on time. Um, one of the things that NCI we try to do is really uh, make sure that we stick to time. Um, we now have the discussion part and the panel part, uh, and uh, I'm just going to hand over to uh, Dr. Pranab Sen, uh, who is the head of the India Growth Center, um, International. International Growth Center, uh, but the India chapter of it, uh, and of course also Chief Statistician uh, and uh, Secretary uh, in Mosby prior to this uh, role, Chairman of the National Statistical Commission, a range of different responsibilities that he has uh, held, uh, Planning Commission as well. So let me hand over to uh, Pranab and he can introduce, uh, though everybody knows, I think, most of the people. There's also a sheet, by the way, in your uh, pamphlet or in your package that uh, has everybody's bios. So you can move quickly into the, into the discussion part. Thank you, Shekhar. Would you like second. To? Okay. Make a second. Uh, okay. Well, welcome to the panel discussion. Um, the topic, as you can read from the, the handout that's been given, is balancing macro stability and deeper structural reforms for a growth recovery, uh, which, of course, as a title, left me thoroughly confused. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know you needed to balance those, but apparently NCAER does. There are deep thoughts happening there, which I am not privy to. <laughs> so uh, now, having been thoroughly confused, I figured that uh, as the moderator, my job is, is really not to keep my mouth shut because I don't know what I'm going to say, and it, hand it over to the four panelists who presumably have thought about it and have decided to talk on one of the issues or the other. Uh, I would like to lead off with Vinayak because he apparently has a presentation. He loves presentations. And he's, he's got one, which makes a, a convenient starting point for the others because then we can actually get into a more discursive mode than, uh, than would be otherwise if every one of them were to be giving a separate uh, lecture, although we'll have some of that as well. So, uh, Vinay, can we start with you and then we'll move on. Thank you. Load the presentation. It's a short six slides and I should be done in seven minutes, hopefully, over other than the ten allocated by Bornali. Okay. 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 All right, um, so while they're loading, uh, let's just kick off the discussion. And, you know, as we heard uh, that the, in the last session, that ITES was one of the sectors that was still holding up, if everybody else is tanking. And uh, since that was mentioned, why don't I ask uh, Dev Jani Ghosh to kick off? At least we can start on a bright note, and then we'll get to the gloom and doom. Yeah, OT, uh, so we'll, we'll have this that. nice downward trajectory. I, I, was, I was watching on my way to this place. I was actually watching the review on my phone. And uh, I was completely perplexed about what to say here, because I'm not going to fit in much with the gloom and doom story. But you know, there's, there's a logic to the madness that we see, especially in IT. Every time there is a slowdown, and if you go back in history and you look at the various slowdowns that has happened globally, every time there is a slowdown, companies, organizations will look at ways to get more effective, will look at ways to bring in higher efficiencies. In today's world especially, uh, when you're talking about effectiveness, when you're talking about efficiency, some of the emerging technologies and the innovation that we are seeing in these areas, especially AI, IoT, etc., uh, is becoming an absolute must-do for every single CEO. Recently, Gartner had its symposium, and I'm sure you would have seen it, and it's not just Gartner, PwC has called it out, McKinsey has called it out, Accenture has called it out, everyone has called out that one of the 
top must do's or top priorities from a ceo perspective is the digital transformation of the business to drive efficiencies to drive effectiveness in the business so it's not a surprise that id spending worldwide is actually going up in fact uh, we just had the numbers for india a few days back india it spending is going to increase around 6.6% in 2020 to reach around 94 billion majority of that is going to be driven given by software and services software and services is growing to grow around 15% and 13% respectively everything else is a low single digit but software and services is where the magic is happening so we are seeing so for the industry especially the industry that nascom looks at uh, we are cautiously optimistic because as bernali i think rightly said we are living in a world of tremendous uncertainty so it's it's we will never i mean i will never sit down and say all is good i mean we are cautiously optimistic uh, we grew around 8 to 9% last year we are 181 billion industry today um we are on a good footing this year i don't believe in forecasts i don't believe in predictions given the way the world changes but we are on a good fitting the uh, footing the trends are good uh, more importantly one of the key criteria that everyone looks at right or wrong uh, is jobs for this industry and if you look at jobs if you look at till september the top 20 listed companies despite having changes made for example uh, decreasing some of the uh, mid tier employees but increasing the entry level inquiry because the skill levels are changing uh, the top 20 listed companies would have added around 50000 net jobs so created net jobs this year this year this year up to september uh the startup ecosystem the tech startup and nascom looks only at the tech startup ecosystem which is around 9000 odd startups in india the tech startup ecosystem is adding jobs pretty significantly just this year up to september they would have added they have added around 60000 direct jobs and around 1.8 lakh indirect jobs so if the investment is technology is definitely paying off also in terms of job creation and we are seeing that happen the one worrying thing or the one thing i am most worried about is that the new technologies that are coming in are creating new jobs and these require extremely different kind of skills these do not need the same skills that we had in the past uh, we are definitely not keeping pace with that change so uh, we will definitely net net the you know even world economic forum has called out around 60 to 65 billion jobs or million jobs will be lost but around 130 million jobs new jobs will be created but these new jobs are going to look very different nascom itself has done a study of the 10 emerging technologies and its impact on india and there are around 55 new job roles that are getting created as we speak uh, which is giving rise to around uh, 156 different skill set requirements uh, our universities are um, k12 our higher education and companies have to significantly drive this change that's our worry that we are going to have the jobs we are not going to have the right people very soon to fill these jobs so that's the worry that i have but that's sort of my outlook of for the industry good i mean as i said let's start up beat um but the numbers are still is so small yeah. in the larger scheme of things you know you're going to invite a hell of a lot of uh, sort of the bad eye <laughs> <laughs> i had all my fingers crossed i'm sure keep your toes crossed as well okay we're going to call you also. okay so uh, good morning everybody and thank you for the opportunity uh, this presentation is is from uh, practicing businessmen it is a little intimidating to be presenting to such a high powered group of senior economists but i'll try and do my best the focus of this presentation is to actually give you a solution and if there is debate and discussion because i also made this presentation at the pmo and at the uh, uh, finance ministry you know the financial services wing and a few other influential people as to what could be a solution to use infrastructure which is the largest driver of investments to pump prime the economy so six or seven slides i should be done in six seven minutes uh 
I think the uh, the first thing about the 100 lakh crore figure is the same as the question that comes about the $5 trillion economy. Where does the figure come from? So I think when the, at the time that both these figures were put out into mainstream uh, discussions, uh, the as economists, you all know how the three things add up to the $5 trillion, the real growth inflation and the rupee dollar parity. But this chart now is a little kind of behind the times, as you can see, because the growth assumptions it makes are far from the reality that was presented before the tea break. But assuming that these, that at some stage we are going to reach a $5 trillion economy, maybe the, the, you will have to push this whole thing down by two or three years. If that is so, the only point I want to make here is that the 100 lakh crore figure of investment in infrastructure, uh, there was a doubt that some manifesto writer pulled it out of thin air. It's actually pretty rational. And if you just see that infrastructure in emergent markets, the target when the planning commission existed was to take it to about 9% gross capital formation in infrastructure as a percentage of GDP. So it's not particularly ambitious. You can see it's 6, 6, 7.5, 7.5, 8.5. That's the minimum, minimum percentage of GDP that we require investment in infrastructure. And assuming that the 5 trillion figure holds, then the 100 lakh crore figure actually suggests itself, as you can see from the last uh, last column. And if you want to be more, and if the $5 trillion economy is going to push outward, then obviously the figure correspondingly with the percentages falls to 89 lakh crores or 69 lakh crores. But for the, for the sake of argument, since there are so many options, let's just stay with the 100 lakh crore figure. And the only point I want to make in this slide, that it's a rational target. It's not an irrational target. Next. So the 100 lakh crore figure doesn't happen at 20 lakh crore, you know, 100 divided by 5, but there's a step up. So I've made some reasonable assumptions about it moving from 12, 15, 20, 22, 29, and you add up to 100 in, in a five-year band. So let's, for the balance few slides, I'm just going to use the middle figure, 20 lakh crores, to actually offer a proposition as to what we should be doing as a solution to fund 20 lakh crores. Next. So how do we break up these 20 lakh crores? Let's start from the bottom. About 6 lakh crores comes from the Consolidated Fund of India, and I'll tell you exactly how this figure is reasonably rational. There are 4 lakh crores that come from other public funds, which is the state investment in uh, infrastructure, which is urban local bodies, bilateral and multilaterals, PSUs, etc., 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 make up 4. Some of, one of the last economic data points that I caught my attention was that last year the state investments in infra were about 2.75 lakh crores, sigma 29 states, or 30 now, whatever. So the 4 lakh is reasonably doable. So the broad point on this slide is that we seem to have a grip on half the amount that the economy requires. The balance 10 is now where we need interventions. We need, and I'm breaking up the balance into a proposition which says we, la we need 2 lakh crores from uh, uh, PPP, which is private investments in infrastructure, and we desperately, desperately require a developmental financial institution for the infrastructure sector. Uh, this is uh, to share confidentially with you as I was driving in today, I did get some messages that there is very serious work being done on this idea in the ministry, in the PMO. So fingers crossed, uh, they, you may see some traction in this idea in the days ahead, but let's see. Now I'm going to ar argue why an unfashionable uh, PPP doesn't require much discussion. Everybody knows private investment is required. It is DFI which is controversial, saying, oh, you're going back to IDBI days. Private industry is advocating DFI now. God help us. But I'll argue why this is required. So if you see, going back, I said that the central, if, you, if I just go back one slide, look at the figure of 6 lakh crores. And I'm saying it's 6 lakhs is rational two years from now because we're looking at the 20 lakh crore figure two years from now. So if you see the budget allocations for this year, and allocations, of course, I'm hoping will be equal to disbursements, is 4.5 lakh crores broadly across these various ministries. So therefore, projecting 6 lakh crores in 2021 or 2022 doesn't seem irrational. So that 6 lakh crore figure has a certain, shall we say, an underpinning of rationality. Next slide. Why do we need a DFI? Corporate India has no appetite to invest in greenfield infra projects in PPP mode. Uh, all of you are economists. You read the papers. I'm not going to make a laundry list of the litany of woes that corporate India has as to why we have no appetite for PPP, private investments in infra anymore. We are just about content with EPC, uh, engineering, procurement, construction, which is just another way of saying we'd be happy to live with public expenditure in construction. We are not putting balance sheet money. Long-term financial institute, uh, foreign institutional investors, please note, 
have rarely put money into greenfield fresh infrastructure projects. Most of the investments coming from the Canadian pension funds, the Brookfields, are, ex are to take over operating brownfield assets. Well, it has a positive point that it unlocks somebody's capital, but it doesn't lead to creating demand for steel, cement or jobs. So you can forget the foreign institutional investor in a difficult market looking at uh, development risk. Commercial banks, and I have colleagues from HDFC and others, are completely out of the game. Every bank CEO worth the name has said, we are not into infrastructure. And the, some of the institutions that were there in infrastructure, like IDFC and ILFS, are no more. Uh, the only institution standing in the name of infrastructure is a PSU, the Indian Infrastructure Finance Company Limited, which is so shackled by its covenants that it can hardly lend. So when you have this situation that there is no capital available, private sector balance sheet, whatever capital will not invest in PPP projects, the banks are out, the NBFCs are out. So where the hell are we going to get the 10 lakh crores from? And that's why we need a DFI. How do you structure a DFI? It's nice to give a motherhood statement which says, create a DFI. So I have actually given a, a far detailed presentation than this slide, which captures just the essence because I had 10 minutes and I said, let me put it all into one slide. So my our suggestion from Indian industries as follows. Please relax the fiscal deficit constraint by 0.5%. The relaxation of 0.5% will yield broadly about 1 lakh crores of fiscal space. We have a target of 120,000 crores of disinvestment. I have not considered that. Please note that there is a separate target this time for asset monetization, which is selling ports, airports, power stations, bus terminals, railway stations, etc., etc. So asset monetization should give you 90,000 crores, assuming we meet that target. You've got a 2 lakh crore equity there, right, available with the government. And now, as per all international norms, banking norms, you can leverage that nine times. You can, on a 2 lakh crore sovereign equity bed, you could raise 18 lakh crores nine times leveraging to have a 20 lakh crore balance sheet. And this is in that DFI, which is a standalone developmental uh, financial institution for infrastructure. Can you raise 18 lakh crores? The answer is yes. With Prime Minister Modi's very successful external outreach, I think as a citizen of this country, I expect some degree of monetization of that goodwill. Let's give you one example. For one project, for one project, the bullet train, the Japanese have given us 90,000 crores at an interest rate of 0.1% for 50 years with the repayment of the loan to begin in 15 years. So surely if we can do this for one project, as a nation, can't we use uh, all our outreach that we have, political, MEA, etc., etc., to garner 18 lakh crores of debt from the Saudis, from the Gulf, to the Nordics, to the Canadians, to the Australians, they would be willing to put money if appropriate, uh, if a DFI is appropriately elegantly and transparently structured and professionally run. These are lots of other slides, but I'm just summarizing there. So that is our suggestion. This is the heart of my presentation. If you don't have this DFI up and running in the next two, three months, you forget about any infrastructure investments. Government fisc, is, as we know, is already squeezed. We don't know how the months ahead are going to be. Public expenditure infra is down. So if you want a pump priming of the economy, here is one solution. I'm sure many of you in the room have other solutions, but I thought I'd come to the house today with this solution. Reviving PPP, second last slide, this government did two things. On July 2014, in Mr. Jaitley's maiden budget, he announced 500 crores outlay for a new institution called 3P India. People have forgotten about it, right? That institution was supposed to completely levelize the playing field and remove all the ills and learnings of PPP in the last 15 years. We haven't implemented that. Uh, and in, later in the year, it also, in its effort to revive PPP, appointed the Kelkar Committee, which submitted a world-class report. If you read the Kelkar Committee report, which had members drawn from the cream de la cream of infrastructure intellectuals, it had pointed recommendations on what can be done to revive private investment in infrastructure. There are many recommendations. I've picked up what I thought were the five most, uh, shall I say, critical in my view. And I'm not going, all of you read English, I'm not going to read out the bullet points. The 3P Institute is something that I've already mentioned about. Municipal bonds for infra, this is what capital markets should be doing. And I think many of my colleagues have addressed the Bombay money markets on this, saying you guys are doing far less advocacy from the NBFCs. I've spoken to JM Financial. I've spoken to many others, saying you, the private sector also has a role to actually push the system, whether it is the urban ministry or finance ministry, to actually move this whole capital market institution called municipal bonds and actually look at India's crumbling urban infrastructure and do something about it. But that's a secondary point. The main point is DFI. Project pipeline is a challenge. In simplistic terms, remember, an infrastructure project from concept to implementation in the best of times is four years, right? So for a 20 lakh crore investment every year, you require an 80 lakh crore pipeline. Now, God help us. You think we've got an 80 lakh crore pipeline? 
So as much as all of us economists are worried, where will the financing come from? Where will the financing come from? How many people talk about, is there a project pipeline? Assume I give you a 20 lakh crore check today from the government. Where will you put it in? We don't have projects ready. The ministry has just about woken up to this issue because of us shouting about it and have created a national infrastructure pipeline portal of which I am still to see how much uh, traction there is in terms of reaching an 80 lakh crore pipeline to achieve, uh, you know, there is of course a starting stock, which I haven't mentioned here, but that's very small. I'm done. Thank you. Well, you may uh, not opening it up that's yet, <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think it's, it's a useful lead-in to the views of the, the finance sector on, on this matter. And uh, so who shall I give it to, actually? Because I think both, both of you would be able to talk about it. Let me begin with Abhi. Uh, where is he? Yeah, oh, there, you, there you are. Your, your views on what uh, the issues really that Vinayak has raised. Uh, just a couple of comments on specific things that Vinayak has raised. One uh, is the uh, is what he pointed out as the bank's reluctance to lend to any kind of PPP. Um, I think uh, the PPP models have seen some evolution over the last um, few years, and at the heart of the evolution has been a an attempt to match the risk preferences of the private sector. Uh, with the project risk and consequently we have things like hybrid annuity model, the HAM model, which has been um, reasonably successful and uh, my understanding um, of, of uh, banks, um, both my bank, uh, HDFC bank as well as other banks, they are, are comfortable uh, with this model. So it is uh, i i wouldn't make sort of a blanket statement like that pppps are completely out as a credit avenue for banks but i i do i do see uh, a, a lot of merit in uh, thinking of um, uh, almost the, the dfi seems almost like a sort of a canalizing agency for um, for, for resources that are available all over the world to the infrastructure sector. Uh, this, of course, will re re entail costs. It will have some fiscal impact. Uh, I just leave uh, Vinayak and all of you with the question is whether we can, the corporate, we sort of worked so hard on developing the corporate bond market. And again, the uh, the, the spirit and philosophy behind uh, developing the corporate bond market was to remove the asset liability mismatches that um, automatically come in when banks lend for infrastructure projects and then you have this NPA problem, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the sort of the more specific roles that the corporate bond market was expected to play was to fund infrastructure. And I wonder, you know, I, I all, I'm very careful about these uh, monolithic uh, institutions because we've had a history of you know problems institutional problems with them and I, I don't know what whether we uh, if you give the same kind of guarantees incurring the kind of uh, fiscal costs and uh, give a boost to a specific segment of the corporate bond market which is um, in inviting infrastructure money from the same kind of entities that Vinayak talked about. I, I really don't know what, how it will work out. But I, th I think that is an alternative. That is an alternative I think a lot of us have worked very hard towards. Uh, the final uh, comment uh, before I hand the mic back to Dr. Sen is that at this stage, I think um, the biggest element, uh, which is, oh, let, let, let me just say that, you know, on, on a positive note, if I were to strike a positive note for the banking sector, uh, there has been, the, the, there is some improvement. And um, uh, one of the changes, one of the more, more positive changes, is um, the attitude of the RBI. And um, the Monterey economist Michael Woodford uh, once said, when you know asked about inflation targeting, uh, he said that uh, inflation targeting almost invariably degenerates into a caricature of inflation targeting. And I think we had some element of that earlier. 
So what has happened is that the RBI is recognizing, um, I think, very legitimately that there is a growth issue and you can't have this narrative where growth is pushed to the corridors of the North Block and the RBI just, you know, tries to manage inflation. Um, so in terms of specific um, developments that have happened, we have a lot of liquidity in the system, uh, rates have come down. The problem, as I see, is the elevated level of risk. And how can that be addressed? And since uh, we are all trying to be solution-oriented, let me give you two solutions uh, with a little bit of a preface, because I think um, invariably in these models, and, and rightly so, fiscal and monetary policy reduces to uh, issues of whether you're going to spend, or the government is going to spend a lot of money or cut taxes, or whether the RBI is going to cut rates or infuse money into the system. I think um, monetary and fiscal policy can go beyond that. And the two suggestions that I, that I would make is to remove the element of um, risk uh, that hangs over the NBFCs because um, NBFCs are a very critical uh, you know, second intermediary between banks and uh, the huge catchment of borrowers where the real needs and the potential lies, including the MSMEs. So solution one is to have a bad bank for NBFC assets, uh, capital provided by the government, perhaps from the spare, spare money that's lying from the NIIF. And in terms of monetary policy, I would just take a leaf out of what the Fed did in the wake of the great financial crisis. And um, you know, going back to what Dr. Mandel showed in terms of um, interest rates and so forth, if you just drill down a little deeper, you will notice that manufacturing, good manufacturing companies, um, uh, good service sector companies are getting money at very cheap rates if they go to the CP market or the bond market. It's the NBFCs, even the good quality NBFCs, that are not getting the money and that get, and or are getting the money at very high rates. So I would suggest, why not taint the RBI's balance sheet a little? Let it not remain always lily white when the rest of the economy is in such despair. And let them do an open market operation and primary issues of NBFCs. Uh, I'm reasonably convinced that in terms of addressing the elevated risk in the system, uh, this would actually be quite effective. It's out of the box, so I, I'm, I'm reasonably sure there won't be any takers for this, but uh, what the hell? <laughs> well, and since you're, you're on it, let me ask you a question. Huh? I mean, you clearly do not, uh, you're not particularly thrilled with the idea of a new TFI. Yeah. Um, but let me ask you a, a somewhat different question, because you, you did bring it up and saying that, you know, the, the problem in the banking sector is that you have an asset liability mismatch coming from the term structure of the lending portfolio. Um, how would you react to the proposal saying that let the banks borrow from the market, let the banks issue bonds for on lending, which at the moment is not permissible under the Banking Act, right? What happens if you allow the banks to do that? Number one, it then doesn't concentrate the power into a single DFI. So you have, you know, 15, 20 banks who are capable of right. doing so. They are the ones who are going to raise money in the market. You may actually kickstart a, a debt market. How would you react? Oh, absolutely. And I think um, uh, this reminds me of um, some of the solutions that came out of uh, the UK after the financial crisis that the UK faced and the Turner Committee report and the Warwick Committee report where, you know, banks have different ring-fenced roles and what you seem to be suggesting is that instead of having one single monolithic entity, which I'm sure would have all the problems of monolithic entities in this country, why not have a sort of a ring-fenced division in different banks which are completely dedicated to this infrastructure uh, investment thing? I would suggest that maybe they should be, um, you know, putting their money in, in infrastructure bonds rather than doing uh, direct um, uh, lending, because that would also give a fillip 
to the flow of bonds into the corporate bond market. And if we get a corporate bond market going in terms of pricing and a whole bunch of other things, it's the proverbial game changer for the financial markets in India. Uh, Abhik, you were also, apart from uh, what uh, uh, Pranab just asked you about, you were talking about uh, banks uh, uh, doing this for NBFCs. So could you just say a little bit more about, because that is where the consumer demand is today being heavily constrained. Uh, yes, what I was suggesting were two things. One was just characterizing the role that uh, NBFCs have, which is to borrow from the banks because very few of them are deposit taking and to, uh, because they underst understand or at least understood uh, the the risk profiles of a uh, lot of borrowers that banks are a little reluctant to touch. They were doing this thing of uh, what I would call a sort of additional intermediation. Now that has stopped and that has led to, led to problems. What I was suggesting is that um, if they go to, if they expect institutions like LIC or, bo uh, or banks to invest, or mutual funds for that, for, for that matter, to invest in their securities of any duration. Uh, they don't find too many takers. So why doesn't the RBI step in and say that, look, I don't, I don't want a AAA balance sheet, entirely AAA balance sheet. Right? I'm going to take, you do primary issues, I'm going to do a one-shot OMO just in NBFC bonds. Right. Instead of having a liquidity window, it's, it's the same, but I think this adds a sort of a long-term dimension to, to it. From a political economy perspective, and I'm sorry I'm blabbering on, uh, it is easier to sell because if you do, did it for public sector banks, for instance, which are issuing bonds for recapitalization, there's always this issue of, look, you are responsible for it and you're bailing yourselves out. For the NBFCs, the, it's a different story. They're not largely government-owned. And the problem is really with the very active private sector NBFCs. So this thing of the government, you know, buying its way out of the crisis won't really sort of, at least optically, uh, emerge for NBFCs. Let the RBI uh, do an open, open market operation. You'll have money in the system. You will have the primary issues being subscribed to. Yields will come down and you will have multiplier effects throughout the financial channel. This, the, Fed the, the Fed, if you remember, in the first round of QE, just said, let's wring the risk out of the system. The liquidity issue is secondary. We've, we are doing it the other way. All right. And that, again, promptly leads us to uh, the thing that uh, DK Joshi is best uh, qualified to deal with. So what you're saying, what they're saying, in effect, uh, both of them, is that the nature of uh, financial transactions is really you're, you're shifting it out of the hands of companies who are in the business of producing goods and services into intermediaries. And so a whole bunch of proposals about different kinds of bonds are being discussed. Uh, the question is that one of the problems that we've always faced is that it's extremely, extremely difficult to rate an issue which doesn't have an underlying asset. The, the assets that are going to be created are a derivative asset from lending to other entities. Does it or does it not raise the risk that of in the system systematically? Well, I, I mean, from a rating perspective, I don't. I mean, I come from a rating agency, yeah, but know. I'm not supposed to speak about ratings. Oh, I see. So, yeah. So I think no, because but the general uh, economics of it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, so. I would not comment on what kind of a risk will emerge out of it, but. Yeah, I think uh, if you don't have an underlying asset or, uh, or a strong parent, let's say, I think things become difficult. If you look at the NBFC space, the ones which have strong parents are doing extremely well. I think they're raising money at uh, the transmission from RBI's interest rates has been pretty sharp to them, and they're raising money at very, very fine rates. I think the housing finance, some of the housing finance companies or even the government-owned NBFCs. So it does, it does create a problem, I think. Uh, I think let me stop. I think since it's a ratings issue, so let me stop at that. No, no, but then, then continue. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. with no, what, on, on what the, the other, other people have yeah, talked yeah, about. Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a specific question. Yeah, I, I think what, just to leave yeah, what we are witnessing, I think, from a very, uh, uh, from a 36,000 feet, we are witnessing that uh, the, the, uh, the role that markets are playing is increasing gradually. I think it's uh, uh, the, the banks, uh, the, the, the NBFCs 
I think they will continue to play a role. But in terms of particularly lending to large infrastructure products, uh, projects, I think go government was trying to take the banks out of that space because ALM, etc. Now, I think bond markets are the logical solution for that. They have been doing quite well. I mean, they've been growing at 14, 15 percent. Uh, so, uh, and India is quite underpenetrated as far as the bond market is concerned. So, the stress in the financial sector is a good time to push the bond markets. I think the the Malaysian example we all know, uh, and and I think there you'll need to do a couple of things. I mean, one is that uh, the 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 ratings of uh, infra companies are generally very weak. I mean, they. they and, and so how do you need to create a, a market for, for, for lower rated paper? And for that, I think you need, uh, uh, you need a system where, uh, uh, where the bankruptcy code works very effectively. And right now, I think uh, the financial sector is out of the purview of the IBC. So you'll have to do something to, to ensure that people who invest in those low-cost low paper, because you can't put contractual savings in low-cost paper, they are able to recover that. So I think that kind of a mechanism is needed. And I'm actually quite hopeful that the bond market will now lift. I mean, uh, I think given that the, 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 uh, the stress in the financial sector is, is evidently coming from partly from the way I think it was structured. So you, this is the time to both, I think, in terms of intermediation, I think markets are going to play a larger role. And I think particularly bond markets for, for infrastructure will play a key role. I think that's, that's the standard model. And I think that's what we need to push right now. So are you then suggesting, if I interpret you correctly, that the government does not go in to directly borrowing from the market, but essentially backstopping uh, borrowings that are being done by private entities? Is that what you're suggesting? No, what I'm saying... So that you're giving a certain degree of confidence to these issues. Right, right. right. And uh, yeah. now, so, it, so what you're talking about is instead of a direct upfront payout, the government is actually taking a contingent liability. Well, I think uh, not necessarily. I mean, what I'm saying is that you need to develop uh, uh, the corporate bond market in a way, in, a, in an environment where people are able to recover their debt even if it is low rated. I mean, so that's, that's, the, that's the point I'm making. Because infra by nature cannot, unless you no, give a should, but, like No, no, but this, again, let me, let me come back to the point I was, yeah. I was making. That look, the nature of the problem is that if there's a bond market which is, uh, a bond which is based on a real <laughs> asset, yeah. Right, then the IBC kind of procedure works. Right, right. But if the underlying asset is a derived asset, then the IBC procedure simply breaks down, because all you can do is to take over yeah, the yeah. the uh, the uh, financial assets. Yeah. Right. So the IBC simply doesn't work in right, these right. cases. No, I agree. Now the question then is that if you're going to get uh, the bond market going, you're suggesting that you need a certain amount of assurance regarding the principal. Yeah. Forget about the return, but the principle has to be in some form guaranteed, which means that ultimately the government has to, to step in. So the argument that we are getting is either you set up a, a publicly owned DFI or which is a direct payment of however much uh, billion you talked about, yeah. or you actually take on a contingent liability by backstopping private borrowings, right? Well, to so some that's, that's your choice. I think to some extent, yes. I mean, because uh, the, the infrastructure, given its nature, the, there are too many risks. I mean, unless sure. you, yeah, so I think unless the risk taking is balanced, I mean, so somebody will have to in, give comfort. I mean, so as uh, uh, Mr. Vinayak was mentioning, uh, the assets that are attractive are assets which are already ready. I think there's huge competition to buy those assets right now. I mean, the, whether it is roads or it is uh, even transmission assets, I think people want to, uh, the foreigners want to buy that because there is no construction risk and you can run the project effectively. So, that's so this is the monetization of assets that's right. part of it that you're talking so about. So which essentially means that government will have to play a larger role as far, I mean, as long as the asset is not ready. Once the asset is ready, you can bring in the private sector more effectively. Okay. So now I think we, we've got this part of it reasonably well covered, but we still haven't really come to the question of the issue of macro stability and structural reforms. All right, on the issue of uh, macro stability, okay, one of the things that everybody has been kind of tiptoeing around uh, is the fact that the government has actually reduced its expenditure, yes. not by actually reducing its expenditure, but essentially not paying its bills, yes. right? Which means that the government is transferring a deficit from its own account into the accounts of the, pri of the private yes. sector, yes. right? 
Now, this is a very unstable situation. Yeah. Because then what, what's happening is, whereas the government can actually raise money with government bonds or get the RBI to print money and give it to it, the private sector has no recourse. Now, if this, this to my mind, is the immediate problem of macro stability. So if you say that macro stability is essentially about a 3.5% fiscal deficit, the answer that I would give is that the, that's actually creating a much larger macro instability than if you simply accepted that your, your actual fiscal deficit is 5.5%. How would you uh, react to that, and what would you suggest? Well, I think the... We need, a, we need a system of budgeting where this kind of thing is not possible. I mean, you move away from uh, the, 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 the cash-based. Uh, uh, but I would say that it's not that government doesn't recognize this. I think there was a st I don't know the progress on that, but government uh, finance minister did announce that they are going to accelerate that. Uh, I don't know where they are on that, but I th there was an amount announced that we'll clear the clear the dues. But this has been a common problem. I agree. I think I also don't know. I mean, Mr. Vinayak would know much better as to what is the what is the total pie which is unpaid. But this is a common problem, and what it does is I think it percolates down. I mean, it co it causes problem for channel financing. I mean, because yeah, so Huge. yeah, so it, and and right now we're in an environment where banks are also very reluctant to lend. So it it kind of becomes uh, uh, I think feed into each other, and I think they tend to spiral the, the economy down, I think, as a result. I agree. Uh, Mr. Shvastav, would you like to come in at this stage? I would like to speak uh, from uh, my personal experience of implementing uh, some of the major infrastructure projects. Uh, basically, I would like to endorse the suggestion made by Avik and uh, the other friend, uh, laying more uh, stress on the corporate bonds. See, I was in Karnataka State implementing the irrigation project on Krishna River, which is called Upper Krishna Project. Uh, the Krishna Water uh, Disputes, uh, you know, Tribunal Award came in the year 1972. The three riparian states, they were given their share, and they were given target to utilize their water share by the year 2000. That is 28 years, no time was available to them. Karnataka government started, you know, uh, the projects uh, like uh, irrigation department project, getting funding, you know, from World Bank, and uh, for all kinds of you know, regions, etc., the project was never and was not moving forward. The Almaty Dam, many of you must have heard, had become very controversial with regard to its height, etc., which was ultimately educated in the Supreme Court by a constitution bench. So, what we found was that uh, the fund which was coming from World Bank was also having several other kinds of you know strings. And the biggest thing was that the World Bank team will come and give all kinds of you no know, gyan to all of us that you do this, you do that, etc. Consequently, things were just not moving. The government of Karnataka took a very bold decision somewhere uh, in you know <coughs> late 90s to access this market through the bond. And if I tell you the rate which was offered that time, you will all be surprised. The rate offered was 17.5 percent, and every six months the payment was to be made. So effective rate of interest used to be 19.25%. We started the whole thing, we created a special purpose vehicle, and I'm very happy to say that this project was implemented well before the deadline. And this has completely transformed the entire economic scenario of the Northern Karnataka, which used to be otherwise heavily you know, drought prone and things like that. So the message which I get is that there is enough money available in the market. When I was uh, um, asking Sudipto, what are the other avenues available to investors like me and him? See, people are actually craving for this kind of instruments to be available to them for investment because they get a short returns. This is guaranteed by the government, etc. So there's no risk involved. And uh, if there is a political will, certainly the process can be delivered. So this is one example. The second example I'll give you in uh, uh, civil aviation sector where I was joint secretary in charge of airports. Uh, I'm talking of 2006-2009 period when most of these PPP infrastructure, I mean, airport projects were delivered and successfully implemented. There again, you know, my own experience is that unless the two P, that is private and public, they work in tandem together, the PP project cannot be you know, successful. What now we find is that in many infrastructure sector, the government P, the public P, you know, becomes a, some sort of auditor, and all kinds of complications are created. So that's why, you know, I'll, uh, I'll close by saying that if there is a political will to implement these projects, money is available in the market, and you can, uh, the corporate bonds is the right kind of new routes, you will have large number of investors, money can never be a shortage. 
this is what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chap, uh, then, Avik, let me come back to you then. Um, again, on the question of macro stability, the discourse today, and if you, and this is fairly widespread, is that India's fundamentals are good. All right? Something which I haven't quite understood, uh, what people meant. Right. Yeah. Uh, but what, what really is your view of macro stability in India? Today, as of now. Um, clearly, I think the fiscal deficit number is an issue. And I think it's an issue because we have kind of almost fetishized it to a point where we willy-nilly scramble to whatever we have targeted. Um, I think there is a serious need, and a lot of us have been saying this, including uh, DK, uh, that uh, Dike Joshi, my, my dear friend, that you know transparency and the fact that you are you you've messed up, but for legitimate reason, and you go to the investor community or you know the external stakeholder community and say that this was my problem. Give us some time instead of somehow you know managing the number where there are uh, the 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 fudges and the artifice is so uh, so obviously clear. I think. We need to change the conversation in some way because I we are in a period in which the private sector has become extremely risk averse and the risk aversion has come from things like not being paid by the government sector and so forth. So I, the government needs to play a bigger role and to play that role, it needs to have a larger um, you know, draft on the nation's resources, and given the absence of you know private um, uh, in interest, I don't see crowding out yeah. as that much of a problem in the short term. Maybe there'll be a little bit of crowding in, and then you'll have to. The the other thing that I you know very briefly I want to say that there is this assumption in our country which I find very difficult. It sort of doesn't resonate with what I was taught in macroeconomics way back in presidency college that. You know, the, the fiscal now the, as the, now now the canon is that fiscal and monetary policy should necessarily move in different directions. I see no merit in that argument, and I think that's another thing that at least the media seems to want to, uh, you know, fetishize. I'm running out of it words. Yeah, <laughs> some of them did actually. I still see some of them did. All right. Uh, Vinak, let me come to you on this. You know, we, we've been really talking about how do you get uh, infrastructure investments back because it is important. And you made the proposal that, you know, PPPs, there's now limited appetite. This will have to be done essentially through public funding. Uh, and given that, so you're really recommending an EPC mode as of now for, for the larger part of Not it. Not if there's a DFI. Well, the DFI... That's a good question. That was the question I was going to ask you. Yeah. yeah, that EPC mode is government actually pays out of budget, which given the level of trust that exists on government's uh, ability and willingness to pay, I think you may have a bit of a problem there. Now you're creating essentially a DFI and saying that the DFI will then take over that, that particular responsibility. Um, now, if you do that, so... All you are doing is you are taking away the need for a private uh, company to approach the market and do, letting the DFI do that role. That's that's what you're yes. you're advocating, right? Yes. So the DFI essentially acts as an aggregator. It does and raises money at the cheapest rates because it, it has sovereign guarantees. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to uh, once again answer to some of the points raised by my other two colleagues who are votaries of the corporate bond market. Uh, as distinct from the DFI, and since it's a nice, happy debate, I will continue with my side of the rostrum, arguing for a DFI. First, I've been hearing about this corporate bond market ever since I got out of college. And all of you have. Every seminar, financial seminar you go to, bond. from corporate bond market. Aray, Baba, corporate bond market hota, to 20 saal lagta, abhi bhi to kuch dekh rahe. Few growth here and there, from a low base, you say 14% growth, you feel happy about it, good luck. There is no corporate bond market for infrastructure, period. You want to create it, good luck. Point number two. Debt, all this talk about banks and others is debt, debt, debt. Please note that infrastructure companies are 
implemented under SPVs, which are like co companies. It has one-fourth debt, uh, three-fourth debt and one-fourth equity, right? That is the standard classical. So please don't get obsessed about lending. Where is the equity? Who is going to give the equity? In the 60s and 70s in Nehruvian India, when private sector was starved of capital, the three DFIs, IFCI, ICICI and IDBI stepped in with capital, which is the reason many industrial groups exist today. That's correct. Right? So let's not belittle the contribution that DFIs made in a capital-starved nation for three decades before they went out of fashion. Today, infrastructure sector is capital starved for a variety of reasons and we need this intervention. That is my point two. My point three is infrastructure sector has three levels of risk. There is development risk, there is construction risk and there is operating risk. Do you want to put debt money in a high risk and how much ratings do they give when you are at the developmental stage when I am bidding for a project, when I am in the land acquisition, when I am into utilities removal? On the, on the real ground, the ratings are so low, are you advo advocating that so many projects get stalled on the way, you're going to put common man savings into corporate bonds to put it at that stage of the infrastructure project when it is in that development risk, construction risk? I would certainly welcome it coming into at the operating uh, level, which is what the FIIs invest in. So ask yourself, why do the FIIs invest only at the operating risk stage, not at development and construction risk? And would you put corporate bonds at these first two stages? It's a no-brainer. And finally, I think <clears throat> there is a need to push policy. The only thing that works is money. When you have a large monolithic DFI which says I will not re lend to the power sector unless you make these changes, the truly independent regulator, the, the state discoms behaving and not cancelling contracts unilaterally like has happened in Andhra, a large DFI as I said, professionally run. Now, those are challenges, I understand. But if a, when you say I will put my money as a DFI, Remember, in those days, IDBI made a lot of changes in textile policy with their tough fund and various other things. The, a large monolithic has the, has the power to say, I will put my money into this project, which is good for the country, but change these policies and behave. So there are many reasons why we require a DFI. As I said, on this side of the debate, I've finished my points. Yes, I was just about to do that. I was just about to do that, you know. But, you know <laughs> Uh, that, well, you know, the, everything's gotten stuck up in the, the downside story. The upside story is, is still not, uh, and it's, it's in the nature of the topic. Huh? Because if you think about uh, the structural reforms part of the title of this uh, thing, structural reforms are very clear from what the three of you are saying. From Debjani's story, it doesn't even seem necessary. Whatever structural reforms were, had to be done were done in the 90s and they've been cruising since then. Now, the real question, Devjan, which is forget about the software sector in itself. Think about the software sector really doing what you said it, it, it's doing now, which is helping companies to actually improve their efficiency, uh, which is, which is the, the focus uh, of a lot of companies in India. This is the old Japanese model when the economy goes into a downturn, you actually improve uh, productivity. The million dollar question, and this is where the structural reform bit really comes in, is this. I can have two kinds of, two very distinct kinds of interventions to improve efficiency and productivity. One is the one we always talk about, which is improving the productivity of labor, which is almost always labor displacing technologies. The second, is to reduce the material costs of, of production, that is the, the bought out inputs. What are you seeing in the market in terms of productivity increases? Is it that people are going in for robotics or are people actually improving the efficiencies in terms of the inventory management, in terms of the logistics management and that entire range of things that lower the cost of uh, raw materials and intermediates? What is it that you're seeing? So, uh, you know, the, the software and services industry is uh, it's a global industry, right? Our customers are all over the world. And it's a very different picture that's emerging. So if you look at the West, if you look at China, uh, US, if you look at UK, uh, the average median age there is 35 plus, right? And reaching 35 plus, I think, in another year or so. Uh, they are facing that problem where labor shortage is becoming a reality for them, 
right? So a lot of the decisions that are being taken today is to find ways to address the shortage that they have in hand. So there's a lot of, rec the, the way they are looking at technologies, how can it come in and address this gap that, I, that is being created, right? In India, we have a completely different problem. The median age is what, 26, 20, 27, something, something like that. So we are not for many years to come going to face this issue of not having enough people to do the work. And if we bring in technology and start taking over the jobs, it's going to create a huge problem for us. So we have to look at how do we bring in technology to do what you said, which is skill the labor to get more productive, drive productivity by, by labor. And I think that has to be the approach to India. Now, uh, India digital transformation is still very nascent. It's still early days. Uh, it has to evolve. And I think we have to have the right policies, etc. in place to ensure that it evolves in such a way where it is about skilling the people that we have rather than displacing them. And, and you see this playing out right now in the way the IT services industry is transforming. If you look at the the hiring patterns within industry and you look at the skilling patterns within industry it is not about robotics coming in and and doing the work it is about ensuring we find the right talent and we skill it in a way that they're able to do the job and they're able to do it with a high level of efficiency so i think these 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 patterns are going to depend on the part of the globe that we are servicing and what is the requirement there? But India definitely needs something that is a people plus model. The reason reason I bring it up because uh, quite often uh, adoption of technology is uh, sort of comes from a demonstration effect. So if I have the West, which is reacting to a completely different set of uh, sort of uh, constraints, and are essentially doing uh, people replacing. Uh, technology, there's a very strong likelihood that there would be a Me Too effect out here. And we may end up, because somebody, a good company out there is doing it, therefore we should be doing it, doing exactly what you said should not be done. Yeah. Right? Now, are we actually seeing Indian companies coming to the uh, IT sector and saying, no, I don't want what he is doing? This is the nature of my problem. Can you fix it? Is is that question even being asked? I, I, India has to have a new playbook. Adopting what the West is doing is not going to work for us long term. I think that that's that's, and that's a realization that is slowly becoming. Um, I mean, the awareness is increasing day by day. Are we having companies come to us, come to the IT services, and say this is how we need it? I don't think those conversations are happening at the level they need to happen today. Definitely not. You're right. There's a lot of me too. Um, I mean, you see what's happening in the West and you decide that's best for you. But we have to start changing the conversations because otherwise this is going to create a huge problem for India. If we, if we ape the West today and we bring in their playbook to India, it's going to create a huge problem. And I think this is where industry, government, everyone has to join hands and ensure we create the new mindset. I honestly think a lot of these issues we are debating is about the old mindset. Um, the world is changing, India is changing, and we have to bring in a little bit of a different mindset, which is thinking about India first, because we are in a unique place. I mean, we are, like it or not, in a few years, we are going to be one of the key economic superpowers in the world, and we are still going to have the largest number of uh, poor people in the country. How do we balance the two? People is one thing we'll never be short of. So we have to figure out a way to leverage that and turn that into a strength rather than it becoming our biggest weakness. Well, on that note, because I think the point that is being made, and I completely agree with it, uh, is that one of the structural reforms, real structural reforms we haven't talked about is a mindset problem. And mindsets are much more difficult to change than labor laws or, or land regulations. Uh, and we haven't even started talking about it, let alone have a game plan in place to actually start building this up. Um, so I think we've moved to structural reforms of a very, very special kind that hasn't been talked about 
in the public discourse. At this point, I think we have run out of time for the panel itself, and I open the floor to, uh, to comments, questions, uh, observations. Can I start with Suman? Uh, thanks, um, Pram. Uh, I'm very sorry to have missed the first half of the discussion, so my comment will be to what Vinayak started off saying. I have to say that he's responded in his second round to some of the issues. But given what uh, Devjani just said, um, I will look at the PAC to see what it has to say about productivity. Because at the end of the day, you know, total factor productivity, labor productivity is what this is all about. And the two tools that we, that we economists have uh, to think about uh, what squeezes productivity out of the economy uh, are basically competition policy and trade policy. Uh, so I don't know. I expect that Sudipto and his team have looked at the issue of what's happening on trade policy. I do want to say that competition policy in India uh, tends to be somewhat neglected. And so the issue of whether Competition policy is an additional tool that uh, we can use to squeeze uh, pr additional productivity out of the economy is important. Uh, I think for NCAR, the question of how much we are doing to measure and monitor what's happening uh, to either labor productivity or total factor productivity becomes an important issue. Uh, I mean, there is the CLEMS work that I think ICRI has been associated with the RBI. But to me, uh, something that um, a think tank has to keep its eye on is what are the productivity numbers. And uh, uh, so I, 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 I'll, I, I missed the presentation, maybe they're there. However, I'm here primarily to, to respond to what Vinayak had to say on infrastructure. And my questions are essentially two. So, uh, you know, given the Einstein definition of madness doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome, um, so what is the lesson to be learned from, say, IDFC? I mean, when I came to NCAR, uh, the Rakesh Mohan report on infrastructure had been the, uh, the, uh, the basis for the setting up of IDFC. I don't know whether we know how that story ended, but we'd like your perspective on how that story ended and what we can learn from, from that. because. Uh, we have HDFC, which is a successful model, and maybe ICICI, of models of people who started off the, the, down the DFI route and found that because of the deterioration of asset quality, the only the way that they could adapt was to get uh, CASA, as it were. So what's different in the ecosystem of Indian finance today that we will not end up having another institution that goes chasing CASA because of asset quality. And my second question uh, for you, Vinayak, is, is the demand really there? All you are talking about is on the supply side. But, you know, there was a headline the other day that basically uh, thermal plants are shutting down because there's a massive slowdown in, uh, in uh, electricity demand. So what is the, as it were, institutional or investment structure that will, that is best suited to deal with these ups and downs and linked up to, in a sense, I guess the point Abhik was making uh, is um, what prevents us from adopt, from successfully, um, as it were, executing the Macquarie model, the the uh, European toll road model. We, I don't know if uh, Bajal, Pradeep is still here, Bajal Saab, etc. So, you know, those have been, as it were, goals for infrastructure since who knows when and is it demand risk is it political risk uh, is it risk at the st at the uh, subnational level risk at the national level so what is it that we're learning from the past that will make the future different given that we are as uh, devjani said you know a much more important player in the global economy uh, with all that that implies thanks for your patience pranab Shudipto? Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, Pranam. 
you know uh, while listening to uh, vinayak and uh, abhik it appeared that they are talking about two very different uh, things and uh, uh, at opposite poles as it were but in one thing uh, they have uh, uh, a common perspective uh, vinayak actually even voiced it i was going to ask him that question but he said it that basically he is thinking what both of them are by the way thinking outside the box and i think that's very interesting given the situation we are in but in his idea of bringing the uh, you know these dfis back in uh, he actually said that this would be sovereign risk and i imagine uh, in your proposal abig when you talk about you know open market operations to 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 uh, help out with the nbfcs that is also sovereign risk with the rbi of the rbi is owned by the government of india so that becomes sovereign risk so that is an aspect that you all haven't commented on given that we are barely you know in uh, investment grade and so on i mean as as a nation uh, what you think would be the risk implications of adopting either uh, of these two strategies because you have been emphasizing a big this who of you know uh, taking risk seriously in uh, especially in a macro projection and so on so that's something i wanted uh, your thoughts on but also if i may just float this idea which brings together what both of you have been saying and that is that if you have a dfi with all this clout that binak talks about and we can actually force behavioral change on 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 the people who like to borrow uh, which the world bank and the japanese do pretty effectively uh, now if you don't i mean now who is going to you know buy the shares of this dfi it is owned by the government to begin with but you could also think of a situation because you all talked about you know uh, ring fencing part of lending by these commercial banks of uh, uh, developing the long you know long end of the bond market so far we have failed but what about having consortiums of banks you know uh, especially public sector bank but also private sector banks them putting together some of the capital for this dfi because then it is not entirely sovereign risk it is partly picked up by by a consortium of banks it is distributed risk and so that so that's just a thought i'm also throwing out uh, really reacting to what you're saying the other final point i wanted to raise and this is with devjani uh, you're very right devjani i think we all agree that uh, you know you need your own playbook to make things uh, about how we should do things here but the question i had is that is is the playbook for a country which will look internally at what's uh, you know where we should go or a country which will need to compete outside globally and we had earlier this discussion about our cep and so on because if you are going to have to compete globally your playbook whatever it is ultimately has to make a competitive in the global market so that's really the issue i had in mind the chinese are great at you know they do have their own playbooks they they borrow or steal whenever they want from the west but they come out with their own playbook and it works Uh, and if you look at what they've done you talked about skilling which is the you know tip of the iceberg but behind that there is secondary education there's vocational education behind that there is basic education in the primary level and the chinese have vertically integrated reforms right through from from the uh, you know stage 1 to stage z and we don't even recognize we have skills programs but don't realize that that thing is not going to move anywhere unless you get your basic education fixed yeah oh uh, so uh, given the topic of macro stability and structural reforms the usual notion of macro stability moves around inflation banking fiscal crisis etc these are the standard parts of it uh, except that uh, things have been changing internationally in fact the global financial crisis was not around these it was around real estate and in india we have this thing sitting with us uh, real estate huge inventories and um, the price is not uh, coming down now that is one part of the story 
Um, the other part of the story is, in the context of structural reforms, uh, land market is a big issue in India, and it needs a structural reform there. Now, there is a connection between macro stability and uh, structural reforms here, because if you deal with um, the land market, structural reforms, in one way or another, eventually come down to the issue of making land cheaper. Now, the moment you uh, talk in terms of making land cheaper, it becomes a big macro stability issue because that is the most important asset, no matter to what extent we discuss the stock market, the bond market, and so on. So here we have a big challenge, how to uh, get to a long-term higher growth rate with cheaper land alongside ensuring macroeconomic stability. So I was wondering if... Uh, there could be talk of this. I, I was a bit surprised it didn't come up at all, so I thought uh, maybe I'll just uh, talk about it. Not everything can come up. No, no, sure. <laughs> You're expected to bring it no, up. No, no, sure, everything cannot come up, but something as important as this at a juncture like this is, uh, which is what bothered me. Okay. But, uh, but I take your point. Yeah, yeah sir. Uh, Mr. Vinak, you referred to 5 trillion economy. I think it's not impossible to achieve it. It will be achieved within a year, two or three. And Modi government is very much targeted. The way Devjani pointed out, people concerned. I am also equally concerned. Whether this gap between rich and poor is taken care, how it will be taken care, whether technological take care of it or somebody else has to come in between. You know, when you talk about employment, uh, we're talking about IT and software, but won't most of the employment come from hardware? And where is India in terms of make in India and manufacturing, which is again heavily dependent on infrastructure? Uh, services are all fine. I mean, you look for a maid, you look for a plumber, carpenter, they all seem to be very difficult to get. There's so many agencies employing them. So maybe that is the uh, one employment intensive sector still going on. But unless you have manufacturing, hardware, we have virtually no hardware. In defense also, we have zero hardware. We are importing everything. We are importing a Rafale jet for 1,600 crores. I think that is nonsense. I mean, that's my opinion. Thank you. Sir, I think make, my name is Alamdar Abbas, make in India as well as make for India is essential to develop a new tendency of uh, reform, transform and perform according to our current uh, Prime Minister of India. I think uh, India is showing a path of global peace and to make India more powerful nation of the world. According to the Piyush Goel budget, uh, t 20 India 2020 and 30 and he gives 10 dimensions I think is it possible okay. uh, so let's let's okay right. yeah. ML Sharma to my mind I think the Indian courts have also played little negative role with the great respect particularly in land acquisition and taxation matters and uh, you can say labor matters because all the big investors they are not coming forward they have fear in their mind particularly the scam and other things they have not disposed of the matters and this is one of the cause also for the present scenario thank you i have an observation to make uh, on Madam Bonali's paper, global trade today is going through worst phase in the last 20 years. This is because there has been hyper trade nationalism. Number two, the WTO with which I was attached has become virtually non-functional. For example, the WTO dispute settlement system is not, will not function from 1st January 2020 because it will only have two members, which needs three members for any adjudication. There has been global trade environment has been unsettled by many phases, 
like Brexit, etc. So the consideration and India's competitive index is not very high. So the any trade estimates in the midterm review should take all these factors into account to have a very realistic the situation in 2020 as per WTO estimates, as per IMF estimates has not been very, very favorable even for trade in services which is the key strength of India. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sen, sorry, I have a flight to catch. So can I just maybe go with answer to Shridipto and uh, uh, so, Shridipto, my thinking is uh, this is where we have to be seriously very creative. Yes, we have to be competitive with the world, but we cannot at the same time ignore India's people problem. It's a it's a huge issue, um, and and uh, we cannot ape what the West is doing. And you talked about China. I'll share some figures which absolutely blew my mind this morning. China's parallel online universe. I mean, all over the world, when you think of search, what do you think of? Google. You think of e-commerce, you think Amazon. You think of social media, you think of Facebook, right? These are the three companies that are dominating all over the world. If you look at the China numbers, when you look at search, Baidu, 77%. Google is 3% in China. You look at social media, WeChat, it's, 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 I mean, Facebook is 2%, <laughs> or just, you know, everything else is WeChat. You look at e-commerce, Tmall, 62%. Amazon is something like 0.5%, right? Now, we can't get there at least not in the near future. We can't create the parallel universe that China has created. But I think there are some learnings in terms of what do you have to do to while you're globally competitive and you are a global player, you still have to ensure that whatever your your resources and people is, you can look at it either which way. On one hand, it's a strength. On the other hand, it's a weakness. How do we ensure but that people problem and therefore a new mindset is absolutely critical. And a lot of people talked about make in India. I think one of the foolish, most foolish things that India can do right now is just go about make in India the way we have thought about make in India in the past. The outside world is moving to robotics. Robotics is taking over manufacturing. Instead of make in India, make robotics in India. Create robotics for the rest of the world. But we have to think through how some of these changes are happening and what is needed for India to be competitive and to ensure that we are creating the right level of jobs that's needed to keep our youth employed. So with that, I am sorry, I really have to run. But thank you very much for having me here. Okay. Thank you so much. Does anybody have a really, really urgent question for her? If not, we'll let her go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Shekhar, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I did want to say that uh, part of the uh, uh, part of the confusion you alluded to in the beginning about uh, balancing our current uh, economic stagnation and downturn and the structural measures that's in the it's precisely this kind of a discussion where while we are focused on our GDP growth uh, dipping, it's really important to see that our demography is happening every day. It is, it's inevitable, the pace of change, the aging of the population, the fact that we are at a very young population still, but in some 20 years, 15 years, will be the world's largest labor force. Uh, and then in 60 years or 70 years, will be the world's largest senior citizen population. So we need to think a little bit about what it is that must be done, should have been done five years back. Five years back, a task force could have started preparing Indian industry for RCEP. We could have really put in place the things that were needed, productivity increases, infrastructure access, credit, all the things that could have made us much more competitive today. So walking into RCEP, apart from the few things about you know the ratchet effect and the base here, there are some four or five sticking points in RCEP. But we could have prepared ourselves much more for that kind of entry into the world's largest uh, now trading block. So I guess this is the balance that we were trying to get to. Sometimes these conversations get to be very much about GDP growth next quarter. But I think we need to be very conscious that these are the 
futures of our children and their children that we are worrying about, and we do need to worry about them. Uh, thank you for bringing that into the conversation. Yes, yes. There was a very lively discussion on uh, the need for long-term finance. And just draw your attention to a few empirical regularities. One is almost no country, especially the developing ones or what are now emerging, have developed without long-term financing, especially infrastructure. Now, two very interesting different models, one for reviving the DFI model, and other is, of course, the banks coming back through some kind of uh, uh, investment into infrastructure. I'd just like to draw your attention. There used to be something called a long-term operations fund. In fact, the problems of the DFI started once the LTO was withdrawn. The LTO actually linked the central bank to the development finance on a hands-off model. Hands-off means once the LTO was given to the DFI, actually it was not an equity stage. It was just a, a sort of a gift, if I may put it like that. It's a, it's a very crude way of putting it. That ensured that the state underwrote financing without actually getting into the business of financing. Unfortunately, at that point, the sort of a wisdom was that we must do away with it. And the DFIs went to the market, borrowed at something like 10 to 12. I think the, they were offering the highest rated bond, I mean, not rated, highest uh, rate of interest on bonds, uh, around 13 or 16 percent. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. And that's when the problem started, when the, after the East Asian crisis, the, you know, the business turned around and all the companies went in for consolidation and all the debt became bad. So we had a good model which actually gave, was given a bad name. So, I mean, unless we are able to bring back something where the state underwrites without getting into the risk, I mean, total contingent liability, perhaps DFI will not work, but it still perhaps is a good, good idea worth taking. As far as the second part is concerned, if you remember, there was a budget where we called something called takeout financing. Now, the takeout financing, I don't think, it never got taken out. It just went down the drain. There is a basic risk there because banks, when they go, do it, who is going to take that? So, I mean, that, that, that idea went through, but unfortunately did not succeed. In fact, nobody took that idea. So I just wanted to sort of uh, remind, bring back some bit of institutional memory on this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Since uh, Suman mentioned my name and there was a lot of discussion on China. I just want to make a few macro points. I'm not going into these details. And I think those macro points are very important for all of us to consider. I've also written a book on China and I've dealt with these issues. Because how, how China suddenly uh, became so big, how China when they were, uh, they, they were equal uh, to India's uh, growth. Uh, as late as in 2000, they have suddenly become so big that everyone is talking of China, everyone is talking of these uh, search instruments, etc. in China. This has been a very fast phenomenon. The problem today is that the world is moving so fast, it's unbelievable. First industrial revolution, 100 years, second industrial revolution, 100 years, third, fourth and fifth industrial revolution, 50 years. So what is happening? And that is natural and no one has looked at it. What is happening? The banks can't uh, deal with this. Banks have not dealt with growth models where a bank finances and in 10 years the technology is dead and gone and you are uh, with NPS. So you have to work at the Chinese speed. Now that's a uh, very difficult question to answer. I will not attempt it today. But we have to understand that the nature of growth and the nature of industrial revolutions is changing. First industrial revolution was on uh, steam engines, etc. Second was on uh, assembly lines, etc. Third industrial revolution was on wire and wireless communications. And that's why the technologies couldn't be kept in the countries where they got developed, Europe and the United States. They went to China and India because there was a wire. There was globalization. Then China, then US, for some silly reasons, wanted to give it to China. And therefore the entire world has changed. Chi 
We did far better than China and IT only a couple of years back. Chinese president wanted to take uh, the chairman of uh, uh, the chairman of uh, this uh, Naran Murthy. He wanted to take him to China to start a number of uh, companies. So it is not as if India was never ahead of China. India was ahead of China a couple of years back. Unfortunately, I. Our uh, lady friend is gone. I want to tell her that 10 years back we were ahead of China in IT. A couple of years back we were ahead of China in uh, mobile telephones. We were growing at a rate which was three times that of China. So to change is not difficult, but we have to identify what's happening and what is happening. Third industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution, fifth industrial revolution on the same wireline of wireless. The medium is the same. The nature of the revolution is the same. You only have to, you only have to tinker. There are any number of companies in India we don't know today who are using robots more than the counterpart companies uh, abroad. Take for instance Maruti just next door. Seventy percent of the workers are robots. So. Yes, I entirely agree. Robots have to be manufactured in India because we have been the starting point of the IT revolution because of the nature of stupid brains that Indians are made of. So we have to encash that. We have to encash uh, all these uh, Sundar Pichai's uh, brains, etc., and build models, and they are simple. But what is required? The entire fourth industrial revolution is dependent on 5G, nothing else. If you look at 5G, 5G will change the world in two years. But what have we done on 5G? Do you see the spectrum? Do you see the spectrum pricing being finalized? Do you see the, the, the equipment being manufactured? Do you see the purchase of that equipment? So we have, to, I just thought that such an enlightened group one should start thinking on those issues. Of course, the problems of DFIs and the problems of courts and the problems of so and so in India will continue forever. And Tarun Khanna, the Harvard professor, says those problems are India's strength. I have not experienced that so far, but he says that the, the chaos in India is India's strength of the future because he says entire China will collapse like Hong Kong is collapsing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have to uh, sort of close down now. So, DK, for your final comments, views, whatever. Well, I think I just wanted to end on a little positive note and uh, look beyond. Uh, uh, should I, do I need to answer the questions or can I be? If you wish to, this is a discussion. Yeah. If you think that questions were irrelevant or not worth answering, please. please no, I think, no, no, I think I, I, can touch, I can touch on the real estate part. I think real estate is, it's not that entire real estate is down. I think it's got a spatial dimension to it. Uh, the commercial real estate is still doing well. Actually, it's doing quite well that I think the, the, the Canadian firms are buying commercial real estate left, right, and center. Actually, my office in Mumbai is also owned by Brookfield now. Uh, is the problem is in the residential real estate and that also in the higher category. I think the, the, uh, the, price, the price point at which they are sold, I think there is not enough market. And this problem is concentrated in, in Mumbai and NCR region. You go to South, you go to Hyderabad, they, they don't have such problems in real estate as we have. So it's not a pan-India problem per se. But I think these two parts are so important that they, uh, I think there's so much of unused inventory that the pain is going to continue. And prices not falling, I don't agree. I think prices are not rising in nominal terms. So in real terms, they have been, I think, uh, in Mumbai, you can still buy a flat what the, at the same price what you could buy five years back. So prices have fallen in real terms. And uh, uh, so real estate problem is going to be a little tougher on the, on, the, uh, on the residential side to come out of. And it's been playing out for some time, and it's going to play out for uh, some more time, I think, uh, unless you exhaust the inventory. I think on the positive note side, if I must just take a quick minute, I think I'm a little uh, positive on the next few years for three reasons. I think one of them, uh, you, you have uh, the uh, corporate balance sheets that are deleveraging. 
and I think uh, the, the, uh, this is a very strong, I think we see it on our ratings. The second thing that is happening is the corporate tax cut may not benefit the economy right now, but it has speeded up the deleveraging process. Actually, they have more money now. So whenever the, whenever the economy turns, the, the corporates are primed up for CapEx. I mean, I don't know when that's going to happen, not immediately. The second is you are scrubbing the financial sector, uh, and I think trying to clean it and also change the uh, credit culture. When was the last time we heard that uh, that promoter is losing his company, which is happening now? I think it's a pretty significant development. So you will have a f you banking sector where. But you you also had a low mailer. Yeah, the, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, but you probably moving towards a financial sector where. Uh, uh, the money that corporates get from the banks is treated as loans which need to be returned and not as de facto grants so i think which was happening i think for the and then uh, uh, the the uh, uh, it's a painful process i mean clean up uh, we had the last clean up was in 19 uh, mid 90s to late 90s and you know what happened to the economy what happened to the markets at that time and the third is i think uh, is a payoff from reforms gst has actually i still remember the ncr calculation that is going to push the growth up by 1 to 1 and 1.5% uh, uh, of gdp actually it probably might have subtracted i mean because of the because of the stress so someday it is going to get streamlined it is getting streamlined, and I think that positive payoff should be visible in the in the next uh, four to five years. So I think these these are some positives I thought I would like to mention towards the. Otherwise, it's the current environment is not that uh, that healthy. Thanks, TK. Abhi, last words. Yeah, quick words. Um, I, you know, I'm Vinayak knows a lot about the infrastructure sector. I'm not a specialist in that area, and I'm sure he has a compelling case for championing the DFIs, <laughs> uh, um, but, but all I'm saying is that there will have to be fiscal costs, there, the government will have to put up money, capital will, be, will have to be brought in. So whether uh, a DFI kind of monolithic DFI kind of model works best or whether we should look at a combination of corporate bonds and some initial financing is really the issue and we have to look at this thing very carefully. I don't think we fundamentally defer that we need a big push for infrastructure. And finally, I think on the point of um, the RBI kind of uh, tainting its balance sheet, uh, the, the only point that I'd like to uh, make, and I, I think there's a huge literature on this, that the central bank should not be treated like any other corporate simply because of the Sinaraj function. And um, it, it can just, you can actually go bust and then Apart from you know some European countries, like Lithuania, I think once where central bank credibility was an issue, it basically affects our swap lines and the rate at which we get it. I think there is, and the size of the OMO is, um, uh, would be so small relative to the overall size of the balance sheet that I don't think it really makes a difference. I'm going to be like a stuck record, and I will <laughs> respond to you. Like you yeah, I know, I know, but I, it's I, I no, no. I know you. You did. <laughs> we will. We will smoke it together. So to answer Suman Berry's question, the Rakesh Mohan Committee, the the seminal 1997 India Infrastructure Report, very clearly said an institution required to be created, as you pointed out, within inverted commas, to lead private capital to infrastructure, which is the reason then Chidambaram created IDFC, registered in Chennai, etc., etc. It did not say we are going to create an institution which is going to cross its hurdle rate of return on capital of 16%. Infrastructure is a developmental sector. We've got to take care of electricity charges, water charges, build roads in uh, remote areas. It requires a developmental agenda. It can't be thrown to the wolves in the marketplace right now. The only institution that can play this dual role of leading private capital at the same time respecting a developmental agenda, looking at the bottom of our pyramid and the provision of public utilities has to be a, has to be a DFI because it can take calls on viability gap funding, subsidy on tariffs, etc., which a private player cannot take. I think that's, that's the biggest public policy message. And the reason it went wrong is that IDFC gradually, and this happens when we Delhiites say that you get captured by the Bombay money market types, is that you suddenly want to delink yourself. You want to cut the umbilical cord from Delhi. Say politicians interfere. They make calls to us as to whom to lend. So this whole thing in Bombay is, as far as possible, distance yourself from New Delhi politicians. And therefore, first thing you do is you list, and after that, you become a bank. Okay. So that's the end of the story. Now, what happens in a bank? You're talking about, at one level, you're talking about why the DFIs became, uh, you know, institutions like banks, because they had their eye on CASA. 
that you wanted retail deposits. Now, retail deposits are not the mechanism for putting into 30-year infrastructure projects. So, therefore, on the other side, you have this great concept called an asset liability mismatch. Now, how do you want to play with this? You want, you want CASA, you want to become a bank, you want to lend to infrastructure, you've got fundamental asset liability mismatch problems. A bank shouldn't lend more than three years because that's the, from old bankers will tell you, that's really the quality of the asset liability mismatch. So, bankers lending to infrastructure long term is out of the question. What they can do is they can lend three, four year money for working capital, EPC companies. I can lend to LNT, I can lend to other companies to buy steel cement to construct a bridge or a road. That's three year working capital for EPC contracts. Sure, they can lend there. And if they love to call it infrastructure financing, it is infrastructure financing, but it is not developmental finance. It is working capital for an EPC project. So the basic point I want to make is then why did PPP fail? Why did everything collapse? For two simple reasons. The risk allocation matrix was completely skewed. The concession agreements were in place without, in, without a parallel institutional mechanism of independent regulators and renegotiation and all other kinds of stuff. So PPP collapsed because of the foolishness of structuring projects with inadequate risk allocation, and that's from the government side, and private sector's foolishness of thinking that okay. let's wait the bid at any cost, baad mein hum theek kar lenge. Ya gold plate kar lenge, ya dono hi kar lenge. Okay, so therefore, I mean, I can go on and on on the subject. Therefore, I'm just saying that the reason for a DFI is to address the issue of a sector which requires developmental finance, a big push for public policy, which a big financier can speak to the government and do. The sovereign, and there is a huge pressure to reduce prices at which utilities are delivered to the poor. So it is the sovereign can raise money at the cheapest rates compared to any market player. The sovereign can take risks beyond its nose in terms of return on capital and the tenure of the capital, 30 years, 40 years. There's a variety of reasons for which today, I think and I'm going to end my short speech, not very short speech right now, to say there are n number of reasons to actually think that the time has come to revive the DFI and infrastructure. We love the banks, let them stay on working capital. Thank you. On that very aggressive note, let me hand it back to <laughs> Shekhar to bring the proceedings to an end. Um, well, it's... Uh, been a very rich morning. It's almost impossible to summarize, and that's certainly not my role. Um, uh, I really do think that uh, we've uh, we both addressed what we had hoped we would address, which are the current uh, problems in our economy um, and the absence of clear thinking on the way forward. Um, we are fiscally constrained. Uh, monetary transmission is an issue. Money for infrastructure projects is an issue. So I think we've laid a lot of the issues on the table. At the same time, I'm very glad that we've dealt with things like skilling, things like the future of competitiveness in our country and how we are going to match up as the world changes very rapidly and moves into labor-saving approaches to production. Uh, we seem to be uh, one large pool of labor that still has to find a way to get the employment for these people. So I, I think we've laid a lot of the issues. Uh, as I said, this is going to be on uh, our websites, IIC's website, as well as NCR's website. We will produce shorter derivatives from this, so perhaps 10-minute videos or clips. Uh, you'll see a few things on Twitter already uh, about uh, uh, specific issues being addressed. That's our hope that people will look at this, it forms public view, public opinion, and that in the end influences our parliamentarians and our political leaders so that we can find a way out of the current situation while continuing to address the longer term issues that go all the way from K-12 to education to skilling to all kinds of other factors uh, in the agricultural sector, in the services sector and in industry. I, I, as I said, this is not a summary, but I think we have got to some very rich discussions, which is the very purpose that Malcolm Adisesha had in mind in, in his time when he started this. With that, I hand over to our real host, uh, Sri Srivastava, uh, and of course, IIC. Uh, thank you, Sekhar. I would like to uh, express uh, our uh, deep gratitude to all of you for uh, participating in this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, no doubt we have taken note of the fact that uh, our currently our economy is indefinitely in uh, crisis. But several solutions have been suggested and perhaps a combination of all these solutions is going to be the ultimate solution. So I would not like to say much. Once again, I thank each one of you for uh, participating in this uh, debate. Thank you so much.
And I think I'll take the liberty of inviting everybody to lunch, which is in the same uh, uh, location where we had tea. Uh, and I hope the conversation can continue over lunch. Uh, please look out for the book that will be produced as the result of this. And do remain active on social media. Uh, I'm not sure there was a specific handle for this. Mira, was there? Uh, was there a? No. Yeah. But there will be on the NCR uh, handle, there will be a lot of material.